This is Max Prudenchik, Rom from Deep Space Nine, and you're listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that didn't manage the same day double bill of Barbie and Oppenheimer. How will we be taken seriously after that? I'm your host Craig and we are here to discuss the news and trailers and other stuff that appeared during the month of July 2023. Joining me for this discussion, he's back from outer space maybe to man the news desk once again, it's Isaac. Hello. Hello everyone. Welcome back to news. Come back to news. I think I've been on news in quite a while, actually. I think it was like February. It was when the last Marvel's trailer appeared, but we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that later. February, March, I don't know. Sometime earlier. Check back. You'll be able to hear it. It exists. It's online forever, perhaps. Before we begin, though, I do want to just throw in a quick statement. We are recording this during the 2023 WGA and SAG AFTRA strike. We as a podcast team are still committed to discussing and promoting all the things we're about to discuss because the best way to support those striking is to show those withholding fair recompense for their work how important that work is. Without the labour of the actors and writers currently on strike, none of what we're about to talk about would exist. And we support their desire to be recognised for the wonderful work they do. That is me speaking on behalf of everybody. So if you disagree, Isaac, keep your mouth shut. This is my chance to run away. I agree writers and actors and everyone else in the entertainment industry who actually do the work and not just sit in a big old boardroom should be paid a fair wage. Yes. It's interesting reading some of the stories and seeing some of the videos of people talking about what the reality of their life is because I think a lot of people just assume that if you're a writer or especially an actor you're automatically rich but the majority of actors are your jobbing guest spot type actors who appear in small roles or they do couple episodes of a tv show or whatever so in some cases they don't know where their next meal is coming from because they book a job for a few days and film an episode of a tv show or whatever and then they're auditioning again yeah it's weird that no one knows who we are and we're in a more safe situation than household names (laughs) that seems that's a broken system well you have actors that are on strikes that definitely won't financially hurt there was a story of matt damon and Killian Murphy and so on walking out of the Oppenheimer premiere after the red carpet bit because the strike had just been declared. So they had to leave if they wanted to be on strike and support it. But actors like that probably don't have to worry about money, but there are a lot of actors that do. And then you have the studios, well, this was in relation to the writers, saying, yeah, we're just going to starve them out. They'll come back to work when they lose their houses and stuff. You're evil. You're actually horrible people. It's weird that they said the quiet part loud in recent interviews. We have no plans of getting better and we never will. Yeah, and what are you going to do? Well, we'll just not work and you can lose 600 grand a week. Yeah. They'll find other ways to get around it. Like House of the Dragon, I think, is still in production because a lot of that's filmed with people that aren't in the union that's on strike. So they can just hire different people from different countries and things to do stuff. Matt Smith's pulling double duty as a dragon and whoever he is and as whichever peasant he has to be. It's a difficult one as well if you want to support it because obviously you want to watch this stuff and you want to make it hurt the bottom line but then if you don't watch this stuff or subscribe to the streamers or whatever then they'll just come to the conclusion that it's the actor's fault, it's the writer's fault. They're not making stuff good enough for people who want to watch. No, no, we want to watch it and they're why. Yeah, it is a difficult one where you have to go on Amazon and Netflix and Disney Plus and whatever for most streaming things. But if you don't watch a new series that's exclusively on those, then they'll be like, it's a show's fault. No, no. No, no. It's definitely yours, Corporate Stooges. But anyway, we support it. So let's see how it shapes out. I hope it doesn't go on too long. I hope they wake up to the fact that they should pay people and do it. I think it will happen. I'm optimistic, but it'll probably just take a while. Yeah. I think they'll try and starve them out as much as possible. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on to our normal stunt. We'll start with a roundup of what we've been watching recently. What have we been watching? What have you been watching? Last thing I watched was with 
you when we went to see Mission Impossible 7. Dead Reckoning Part 1. I wasn't a fan, but you seem to have a good time. Yes, I enjoyed Dead Reckoning Part 1. I actually can't really remember much of the plot, but I can say that about any of the Mission Impossible movies, really. It's very difficult to lock on to what actually happens in them. It's more the... You remember the stunts, and then the plot is just this thin thing that gets you between the stunts and action stuff. But yeah, I was engaged by it. I thought some of the stunts were great. The more about the jump thing, I think I'd seen so many featurettes and chat about it that when it actually happens in the film, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, it felt more emotional on the day in the film that in the movie this kind of happens. I was listening to news reviews, so part of that movie there was going to be a de-aged Tom Cruise segment and i'm going to go against the screen and say that i think they should have kept that because one of my biggest problems i had with the movie is we're supposed to know who gabriel the villain is but i spent the whole thing is like is he from the second movie who's this guy what's going on <laughs> i did feel like there was a lot where the script had been written with more flashback about this character so when it got to the story beats of him and what he meant to Ethan Hunt. I was like, I don't know, we haven't seen this. He's just anybody. Other than that, I'm all geared up for Barb and Heimer, catching Barbie next week, and then Oppenheimer probably the end of the next week too, so that's exciting. And you've seen some other stuff since you got your unlimited card, haven't you? Oh, Indiana Jones, that was it. Yeah, brilliant time with Indiana Jones. Asteroid City, the Wes Anderson movie, it was okay. I think he's in a bit of a dip. A few people I know that like his movies are saying he's getting a bit too cosy with his style. And it's getting to a point where a lot of people are saying, like, well, do a new thing. We've seen this one. There's only so many sort of twee, similar style movies you can do before you're like, okay, this is getting a bit formulaic. It's still good, but it was a bit, I've seen this before sort of situation. I didn't see Asteroids. The trailer didn't really grab me, so I just didn't bother. I don't remember the trailer very well, but it was the joys of the unlimited card sort of thing. It's like, well, it's a no risk or reward situation. The only thing you lose is time which is more valuable than you might think. Depends. I'm just going to go home and be on Twitter for two hours, then I can go to the cinema (laughs) and maybe see a thing. How about yourself? So you look up way more than I'll have watched. Is that everything on your list? I think so, yeah. That's about everything I've watched recently. Any TV stuff? No, looking forward to Good Omens Series 2 is coming up. Mm -hmm. That's not far away. Only Murders in the Building Series 3, I think it's August, Heartstopper. All the summer shows are coming up, so... I'm sort of just waiting for those to kick off. See, my mainstays are all kind of disappearing. So I'm about to have some spare viewing time, which I'm really looking forward to because I've just felt flat out with so many things recently. There's a podcast backlog that just isn't clearing because I've just had too many things. But that's inside baseball and really boring for listeners. Me complaining about how much work I have given myself to do. TV-wise, I've been watching Secret Invasion and I don't like it that much. I think it's really dull. Someone, I think, put it best on Twitter, maybe, where they said, it's amazing how there's a TV show starring one of the biggest actors on the planet and nobody's watching or talking about it. Yeah, I had forgotten about it until you mentioned it just then. As we record it as one episode left, as you're listening to this, that final episode will have happened. So I don't know what the final episode's all about. But if previous MCU TV shows are anything to go by, it'll abandon plot and anything else for some kind of big punch-up. Yeah, probably. That's what they usually do. So I'm not looking forward to the final episode. I haven't really enjoyed the first five. There's bits in it I really like. It's one of those situations where individual scenes I quite enjoy. Because what happens is you get really good actors sharing a scene, delivering dialogue that they can elevate because of how good they are. So you put... Samuel Jackson and Olivia Coleman in a room, you're going to get something worth watching, probably. Yeah. It also has to be interesting. They can act their lives out on something, but if it's a boring show, then it doesn't really matter. Same with Mads Mikkelsen and Samuel L. Jackson. Again, when they share screen time, it just pops. And But I think the scenes are well-written enough so that they have something to actually work with as well. But these are just moments. The overall texture of the show just doesn't work. Did you say Mads Mikkelsen? Is he in it? Oh, no. Ben Mendelsohn. Oh, he's got those two mixed up. I was going to say, oh, Kai Silius is showing up. <laughs> That's a twist I wasn't expecting. Rogue One was really confusing for me. Which one's which? I don't know why I get them so mixed up. They don't look alike. It's the on at the end of their name. It's their names ending in Sonia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> must just be it. And there's Samuel L. Jackson. And the shapeshifters in. This is the most confusing show ever for you. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I'm going to leave that mistake in because I like people to see that I'm human. Listeners, does anyone else mix up Ben Mendelsohn and Mads Mikkelsen? Or is it just me? Discuss. Discuss. Let us know. I've also been watching Star Trek Strange New Worlds and I think season two is an improvement on season one. 
as we record, I've seen eight out of the ten episodes, and the seventh one will have just appeared. Again, as we record, they dropped it early as a Comic-Con surprise, which is great when they don't give you that much notice and you have to plan coverage. It's really great that. Thank you, Paramount. Seriously, though, I get screeners and I'm very grateful. I just would like a bit more time to yeah. deal with these things. But anyway, it is what it is. The episode they dropped early was the crossover with Lower Decks. So you had Jack Quaid and Tony Newsom's characters coming back in time to interact with Captain Pike and his crew. And it was a delight. It was very funny. It was very well put together. So it's good. And the ninth episode is going to be a musical episode. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that works. That is fun. I've seen people complaining online about oh, Strange New Worlds hasn't earned this and they're just trying to do too many wacky episodes or too many gimmicky episodes. Aren't you the same people that were complaining about Star Trek in the modern era being too derivative? Now you've got a show that is trying to just be crazy and do different types of episodes in an episodic format and you're complaining about that too. Just don't watch it if that's all you're going to do. That's what the internet's like. This is either too similar or not similar enough. This is derivative. We give you something different. No, I don't like that either. What would you like then? Nothing is the answer, probably. But that's really been it for TV for me. I haven't been watching a lot of new TV. I should get on that because there is a number of things I do want to watch. Once Strange New Worlds finishes, I'll have a bit more time to dig into some things and watch some things that have been piling up. So I'm looking forward to just having evenings to just sit and do nothing. That'd be nice. That could be fun. Once the podcast backlog is cleared, though, that's going to be priority one. Or kind of priority one. As long as I'm chipping away at it, it'll be fun. Yeah. Movies wise, you said I saw Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I enjoyed it at the time, but the more that I've sat with it, the less enthusiastic I've been about it, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of faded. Yeah, it doesn't stick with me. And obviously, it's a failure, financially speaking, because they spent 300 million on it. And if you're going to spend 300 million on a film starring an 80 year old actor, you're just not going to get that back because I'm going to keep saying it as well Twitter is not real life. It seems that film studios are basing decisions on what people are crowing about on Twitter. Yeah. But most of your general audience don't care about Indiana Jones. It's just some old guy. You'd think they'd learn after they released Morbius twice. <laughs> Stop taking things seriously. Sometimes people are just lying. The Flash just spectacularly failed as well, so that didn't work. Whatever you were trying to do there didn't work. Yeah. But it's fine, though. I, I did quite enjoy a lot of it. Harrison Ford was great. That did have Mads Mikkelsen in it. Did have Mads Mikkelsen in But I thought he was pretty boring as a villain. He didn't stand out. I don't think he was given really enough to do. Yeah, his big plot doesn't really come into the movie till the end. By that point, it's blockbuster end of movie where there's a million things going on anyway. It wasn't given an amazing amount of time to just clear up his thing. And I found Phoebe Waller-Bridge pretty tedious as well. I thought she was fun. I liked that she was in it for the money. Clearly not there to be the new Indiana Jones, just there for like different own reasons. That was fun. If they ever do the Helena spin-off, I don't have to watch it, so that, that's something. Maybe on Disney+. Plus. No, I definitely don't have to watch it. Exactly. Something else I saw was Elemental, the Pixar movie. I thought it was superb. Oh, that was lovely. I forgot about Elemental. Did you see that as well? Yeah, yeah. I saw that as well. I thought it was superb, and it's a shame that it died on arrival. Disney seemed to be trying to kill Pixar by just under-promoting them. Yeah, because I've had a string of pretty good movies. Well, Pixar are usually a safe bet. They don't really release too many bad ones, but say there was Luca and Turning Red and now this one, which have all been not talked about or not been advertised very well. Elemental came down to poor reviews as well, which surprised me because it's one of the few films this year, actually, where I was positively gripped by it. There were certain points in the film that I just, you know, sometimes you're just so captivated by what you're watching, you sort of come up for air eventually and you're like, well, I just lost all that time. I don't know where I was, what was going on. That happened during that film. I can't think of the last time that happened. It's a shame that they're trying to kill it. And we're just going to get Toy Story 5 with Buzz and Woody again. Yeah. Gonna suck. The fourth one was very bad, so I'm sure the fifth one will... Also in animation, I saw Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken, which I thought was fine, but it really wasn't for me. It wasn't aimed at me. So I don't think I was ever going to really connect with it. I thought it was okay. I saw it the same day as Elemental, actually. The double bill I did was that one first and then Elemental, which was the right choice. It was an upward curve. I've also seen Barbenheimer, and the way I did it was Friday night watched Oppenheimer, and then Saturday afternoon watched Barbie. Oppenheimer I wasn't super keen on. I have trouble with Christopher Nolan films anyway, and I think that most of his films have the same issue of it's very difficult to emotionally connect with what he's trying to do. You can intellectually understand it, or I can anyway, because that's how smart I am. I can intellectually understand what he's trying to achieve, but 
when it comes to actually making me care about it, I find it difficult. I don't think that he does emotional stories with characters very well. I've not seen many of his, so I can't really comment on his style of movie, other than the Batmans and Interstellar. Well, they all have that problem, I think. I've not seen them for a while. <laughs> okay. I think I've probably gone back to a couple of the Batmans, but I've only saw Interstellar once. His Batman films, you have scenes where characters sit and explain the themes to each other. They're all the same movie, basically. The interesting thing is, in Batman Begins, you have a long conversation where Bruce Wayne says to Alfred, I really need to become a symbol of fear for the criminals in Gotham so I can stop them. And then people come out and say, oh, he turns himself into a symbol. And it's as if they've interpreted that theme based on what they've seen. And no, no, you haven't. It tells you. It spells it out for you. And I think that's a lot of what Nolan's films do, actually. It does that thing where it explains what it's trying to do to you and then people can repeat it and think they're really clever in terms of interpreting it. Yeah. There's a skill there, no doubt, but... I just don't really connect with his stuff, and Oppenheimer was kind of the same. Okay, doke. Barbie had a lot of fun with, though. I think it's a good gateway to certain ideas that people can start thinking about or look further into after it. It crams a lot in, and I don't think it covers everything in much depth. So you're kind of saying that Barbie's the exact opposite of Oppenheimer, where <laughs> it doesn't just outright tell you what you should feel, but the longer you think about it, the more things kind of seed in, whereas the other one's just like, this is what you're supposed to think. Kind of. It's definitely not subtle with its messaging. It attacks the patriarchy and makes fun of that and the equality issue between women and men and all that stuff. It has all that in there and it doesn't cover it in massive depth, but it's sort of aimed at a particular age group. So it could be that that age group are intended to start thinking about these ideas because the film is pointing them out and then they can take that with them after that point. Yeah, that makes sense. There's definitely value to it and I think it's really good and Margot Robbie's excellent in it. Ryan Gosling's really good in it as well. I really like seeing Ryan Gosling play extra because normally he just stares into the middle distance and doesn't say much. Yeah, now he can really have fun with it. Yeah, it's good. And all the various other Kens and Barbies that you see in the film, they're good. Definitely worth a watch. For me, it was the better of the two. Oh, that's exciting. I'm excited for Barbie. Because you can apparently compare those two films because they came out in the same day. Imagine if two films came out in the same day. Imagine if that would have happened. Ever. Hold on to that thought. I know that's coming up. <laughs> it's interesting to look back at some of the other dual releases. Gremlins and Ghostbusters released on the same day when they came out. The Thing and Blade Runner released on the same day when they came out. If you boil it down, lots of things come out the same day. But we've fallen into a landscape of one big thing in a week and everything else gets buried by it. Yeah. Which didn't happen here. It was actually the first time I'd seen the cinema bouncing, probably since before the pandemic. Yeah, I was going to say, the last time I remember going to an excited cinema was probably Endgame. Yeah, 2019. Was Rise of Skywalker busy? I guess it was, but I don't think there was the same kind of buzz. Yeah, because I think people were going in a bit more cautious. It's good to see that if you make something that people want to see, then they'll go see it. It's basically as simple as that, I think. Barbie's doubled its budget already, apparently, in terms of box office receipts, so that's okay. And Oppenheimer's well on track to make a lot of money as well, which for an R-rated three-hour non-blockbuster, it is kind of a blockbuster, but also not. For something like that, that's incredible and the fact is they didn't spend hundreds of millions on either of those films they were all reasonable budgets so again there's a lesson to be learned there probably will they learn it we'll find out we'll find out it's weird that a movie where they filmed the real explosion to simulate a nuke didn't cost as much as indiana jones <laughs> <laughs> which is just about a man who goes in some caves well i was reading that the secret invasion show costs 212 million for those six episodes what are you spending that on yeah i've not watched it but from what i've seen it's mostly just people in car parks and offices you do have some de-aging and flashbacks with samuel L. jackson and there's the shape-shifting effects and a couple other bits and bobs and people have tried to say that there was some significant covid stuff in there that would have driven the budget up but to that extent plus your actor bill i guess will be pretty high yeah because of who's in it but even then that's mental for something that is it going to make that much traction? There's been talk about releasing streaming numbers to independent companies so that you get the true story of it. And I wonder if the actual truth of it is all this new content that we're throwing money at, people aren't actually watching it. People are just watching repeats of Friends and The Office. Yeah, because a lot of stories were like, oh yeah, but it was filmed during COVID. That's why it's so expensive. I also go with the one example I know, the Flux Doctor Who series. So that was filmed during COVID. I think it was 5 million episode, so like 30 million altogether. So that's one-tenth-ish of the budget of 
Secret Invasion. I know not everyone likes that series, but it looks pretty great. It still looks like a standard thing. And like there's all the other shows like EastEnders and everything else that's been made in that time that just sort of carried on. You'd have to spend an extra hundred million pound on test kits <laughs> and paper masks and stuff. God knows where these budgets are going. I saw someone saying when Quantumania came out, this looks terrible. Is it money laundering that you're doing? Are you just pocketing the cash? It wouldn't surprise me. Maybe. That's what I've seen. A few things. A good variety of stuff. And I'll see more things. Turtles isn't far away. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Do you have anything to plug? Mm, Nope. Well, that was easy. I don't do anything else except for this. No artwork or anything like that that you want to point people at? No. All the links to your pages are in the show notes anyway. Yeah, it's there, but nothing needs advertising at the moment. Okay. Outside of this podcast and the writing that I do on Neil Before Blog, I'm in the midst of the coverage of Strange New Worlds on We Are Starfleet, which is the We Made This Network's podcast about Strange New Worlds. I've appeared on most of the episodes of the first eight I was only missing for two of them and I hosted two of them they were back to back six and seven which was great for me especially with the episode seven crunch that happened but listen to that there's some great guests and voices on there that you can hear talk about Star Trek so there's that I don't know if it's out yet but I'll record in a retrospective about the Angelina Jolie Tomb Raider film the first one for a Red Dwarf podcast, which may sound like madness, because what's Tomb Raider got to do with the Red Dwarf? But the link was that Chris Barry's in the film. That's enough to do a whole couple hours about the Tomb Raider movie, apparently. I wasn't complaining. I was happy to do it. Another one is that I was on Den of Ten, which is a Top Tens podcast, and I talked about video game movie adaptations. I came up with a list of ten video game to movie or TV adaptations that I liked I'm not really a top 10 type guy, so I just came up with 10 and put them in some order. Yeah, 10 sort of random ones. Yeah, I didn't really think too much about it. That was a fun conversation. I quite like making people aware that the video game to TV or film adaptation space isn't always terrible. Mm-hmm. It just has that unfair reputation, but there are some good stuff in there. There's some not so good stuff yeah. in there. And that's about it for me outside of this, but a few things that you can also hear me on doing different things on where someone invites me on most of the time and i don't have to host and i don't have to edit i'm always happy to give my time always handy witness how the other half live when the conversation ends and i send my file i'm done yeah okay let us move on to some trailers we have a few this month a few different things but also some connected things which will be interesting in terms of how i've put together the list which we'll cover as we go so the first one is one that you said that you're pretty excited about a haunting in venice what do you think of this trailer i think this is lovely because i've not seen the first two of the kenneth Branagh pyro movies which were very or appeared to be very how you do a agatha christie soft crime thing loads of celebrities and a fancy estate building and everyone meets in the drawing room when pyro goes through the list and all that sort of stuff but i love that this one's just like we're gonna do a weird horror <laughs> it's gonna have ghosts and exorcisms and seances and i don't know this just seems there's so much Sherlock Holmes and poirots and gentle crime dramas and stuff i'm really excited to see we're gonna do one in just a variety that i've never seen before it's kind of gone from a movie i wasn't aware of because i've not been following the braniverse of poirot movies to watch a trailer like oh wow this actually looks amazing <laughs> so i'm really excited for this one there's already three of these somehow yeah I'm still waiting for them to team Miss Marple and Poirot up, which seems to be the perfect studio choice. But I don't know, I think this looks really fun. It's impressive to make a 1920s crime story look fresh. I've seen Murder in the Orient Express and I quite liked it. I never watched Death on the Nile for whatever reason. And when the first trailer appeared, Andrew was on the news pod that month talking about it. And he gave me some context to the original story that I didn't have. It's Poirot towards the end of his career, at least in the book. I don't know if that'll be the case here. Oh yeah, the Halloween party, what it's called. Apparently it was poorly reviewed. Okay. And there's an Agatha Christie insert there who's someone who's just tired of doing the same old stuff as well, as in the idea that Poirot's been solving these kinds of mysteries forever and he's sick of it. That may be in there. And he didn't explain whether it's actually supernatural goings on or whether it will all be explained Scooby-Doo style. The extra fun is, I think whichever of those two options it goes with, if it goes with a ghost thing, then 
the vibe of the movie looks like, that's still kind of interesting. Even if they do have a logical explanation around it, they could still sneak in, well, some things aren't explained, but it kind of looks like it's going to be a win-win situation where they can either go like, oh no, this is just an unusual supernatural thing, and it still looks like it will work in the movie, but also if they do, oh, here's a really clever explanation for how we did all this stuff, then that's great too. The appeal of it is that Poirot is someone who's heavily logical, he understands everything that surrounds him, so if you face him with something that he can't easily explain, then that's a different challenge for him. Whether it ends up being supernatural or not is kind of irrelevant in terms of that setup, because you still get that where he's like, I have no idea what's going on here, and I don't like it. Yeah, The Hound of the Baskervilles is the other famous one where, in every variant of that story, the whole point is, you take the very logical Sherlock Holmes character and just kind of throw him in a thing where he just can't (laughs) comprehend what's going on. I am out of my depth. All of my skills are useless currently because this is not how I deal with it, which is always a fun thing to do. And then the BBC one, it was just a hallucinogen. Spoilers. Yeah, I think it's a lot of stone. (laughs) In terms of Sherlock Holmes, the first Robert Downey Jr. film was, uh, this looks to be a supernatural thing, but it wasn't really. Oh, that had magic, yeah. Guessing ahead. Some of it will be explained. Poirot needs a win. You can't just be like Poirot going, I'm going to figure it out. And he's like, nope, I'm I'm just going to go home and not tell anyone. (laughs) And not sleep for a couple of days. So I think there'll be a murderer situation and there'll be some trickery going on. But I think they could also squeeze in. Not everything has to be explained, I think, will be the way they'll go with it. But yeah, this looks really fun. I don't know how faithful to the original stories the other two films were. No, and I think if this was a poorly reviewed book or based on a poorly reviewed book that probably gives them more freedom to kind of do what they want because there'll be like three people who absolutely love this book who'll write emails in but it's not like the orient express where it's considered the best one or whatever where you can't mess with it yeah one of the notes i have as well is is michelle you again does she ever sleep yeah she's just getting all of her work in she's certainly having a moment just like pedro pascal in everything all of a sudden yeah he'll show up again he may show up later yes yeah. the next trailer is migration It's an Illumination Studios thing about ducks. I quite like this trailer, actually. It's very charming. The story seems to be about leaving the nest and finding the confidence to strike out on your own. Necessary life developments in that way. But also that the life will be unpredictable when you do that. So, seems like a decent enough idea. Yeah, it's not breaking new ground, really. No. But it was one of those ones where it started the trailer. It's like, oh, Illumination. It's like from the makers of Minions. It's like, okay, well... (laughs) <laughs> See if we can chat anything about this. And it opened up and it's really a beautiful autumnal scene and the ducks and I was like, actually, this looks pretty heartwarming. And yeah. It's nice and stuff. So this is a surprisingly charming looking film. I mean, I liked Mario and that was them. Oh yeah, they did Mario. I've never seen a Minions movie and I haven't seen Despicable Me, so I have no idea what their capabilities are. I enjoyed the Shrek they did a couple of years ago. That was quite fun. Was that them? I think that was Illumination, yeah. The okay. Ben Cumber was them. So they've got a good track record for kids' movies. Another note I have is, does Aquafina just like voicing birds? Because she voices as a seagull in The Little Mermaid. Oh yeah, she's a seagull in The Little Mermaid. Maybe if you get you this week, I'm just going to do all the bird roles. <laughs> Mermaid in, I'll go talk to the duck people. And... It's my niche. I'm just going to be birds. Animated birds. I'm just going to do birds for a bit. Get really <laughs> into the bird mindset and do all these. Full method. She's just a bird. She thinks she's a bird. Stealing people's chips. <laughs> well, that could be something that maybe gets watched on streaming at some point, because I don't think I would risk going to see an Illumination film when it comes out of the cinema, because the kids everywhere running around. No, but it looks like a nice movie to watch around Christmas. Like, it's such a heartwarming thing. Stick this on for an hour and a half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Retribution. We haven't had one of these in a while. A Liam Neeson thriller that's a bit like Taken, but it's also a bit like Speed and kind of like Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah. We kind of miss Liam Neeson doing these things. This goes for my funniest movie synopsis of the month. Liam Neeson can't stop driving or his car explodes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he doesn't have to keep driving. He just can't leave the car. Oh, he just can't leave the car. Just have a nap. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite funny how he gets told to go places. It's like, shoot your best friend. He's like, I'm not going to do it. And then the car blows up anyway. It happens twice in the trailer where he yeah. refuses to do what he's told and then the thing blows up anyway. I not watch many weird Liam Neeson movies, but it's got a phone booth feel to it. Yeah, I'll watch it. I do quite like when Liam Neeson does these things. Some of them are not the best, but I've always been entertained by them. Stuff like The Commuter, I think it was called, or that one where he's on a plane. The taken on a genre yeah films exactly just one time fun action romps yeah so see how it pans out but it's fine mm-hmm. it's kind of weird that Liam Neeson's going back to that how bored is he 
Yeah, that's why he's doing. He doesn't have to learn a new script. <laughs> this is what he said on the other one. Just talks about his particular set of skills. Yeah. As in he has a driver's license. Put a bit of blood makeup or whatever on his forehead. Not eye in his suit, so it looks like he's been disheveled and yeah, good to go. <laughs> Hopefully the car has plenty of leg room because he's a tall man. He's going to be sitting in that lot. We don't take back a bit. It's only him in the car. <laughs> There's other people in the car sometimes in the trailer. Oh, yeah. Well, I suppose they want to sit behind. It's a big car. Sit behind him. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of old people doing action stuff, the retirement plan. Nicolas Cage, looking very crazy Nicolas Cage. Stuff happens. It looks a bit insane. I love the cast, and it looks like a lot of fun, this. Yeah. Nicolas Cage being Nicolas Cage. This is what... The Expendable should have been. <laughs> a lot of retired but very professional killer. I didn't write the names down, but there's another old person. Oh, Nick Cage, not. Ron Perlman. It looks like there's another agent or another person that Nicolas Cage's character knows that pulls out a load of guns and goes in. Old soldiers just going on for one last submission. I don't know how old Nicolas Cage is. I think he's 60 something. He's not that old. Obviously, he's been olded up, bit of a beard and long hair. When he saw him in a movie recently, I suppose he was a vampire. <laughs> I think he's 60 something. But yeah, you're right, he's not that old. But the thing about him is you just stick on a, an old man beard. Just let him go, do whatever. Yeah, so I'll watch this. Nicolas Cage usually gets me in the seat. Yeah, it's like the Liam Neeson one. There's certain ones you don't have to put too much effort in the marketing. The draw is, oh, it's Liam Neeson doing a thing, or it's Nicolas Cage going a bit crazy. Yeah. That's a ticket grabber, the rest is just filler. Yeah, well, let's move on. We have The Creator. The second trailer for this. Apparently the budget for this, it's worth noting, was about $80 million. Yeah, it's like no money, but it looks quite spectacular <laughs> compared to like everything else. Looks better than a lot of things that cost three times as much somehow. Yeah, this is definitely good evidence for Disney that's spending all their money on secret cocaine or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So that's worth noting. It looks visually incredible, as you said. I like the ideas of AI, religion, and sort of child protection as well, all merging together. I don't know how it will all pan out when the film's released, but I like the world that they've built. It looks really lived in and interesting and yeah it's got a bit of a techno grime to it yeah i'm really interested to see how this will play out we're going to get a lot of ai as the bad guy or maybe not the bad guy type films i think there's like two more on this list well the next one is but yeah this one i was compelled by it when i saw the first trailer and this trailer i guess it doesn't do anything that the first trailer doesn't but it's also, there's lots of explosions and stuff as well sometimes. It's cool robot effects and explosions and big dramatic things going on. And the suggestion of ideas as well, that's important. The directors have done this sort of thing before. Gareth Edwards? Yeah, the director's Gareth Edwards, who directed your favourite film ever, Rogue One. Oh yeah. He did Godzilla as well. Yeah, so this sort of grubby science fiction, he knows what he's doing there. Well, I mean, based on that, actually, I haven't liked a lot of what he's done. <laughs> Because I didn't like Godzilla, I thought it wasn't very good. And I didn't like Monsters either. I really hate Rogue One. I like Rogue One. Just looking through the list, I haven't seen everything that he's done. He hasn't directed that much. But he does make grubby movies. Yeah. So, that's his style. Good for him. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to our second AI film of the list. Tim, or T-I-M. The Megan movie, but with a man. Potentially, yeah. This is one of the later trailers I watched today, and I was like, I need to look up when they started making this. Is this one where they got this really good idea, then they turn YouTube on, and it's like, oh no, someone's made this. Someone just made our film. Someone just made our film. They called it Megan, and it's out. Or is it one where they've had to, as speedily as they can, go off the success of, well, say success of mine, I have no idea how Megan did. I think it did pretty well. It was getting a sequel. Got a sequel. I'm kind of worried that there's some poor guy who's been working on this for ages. <laughs> oh no, they made it. They made our movie. That just happens sometimes where two people are working on similar ideas at the same time. Yeah. See the uh, two White House invasion movies that came out the same year. Deep Impact and Armageddon. Yeah. Was another one. So yeah, it does happen sometimes. And you can believe that they weren't copying each other because it's just in vogue at the moment. Yeah, in terms of story, it's creepy robot person goes a bit rogue. It's not a million to one that two of those movies have made. Yeah. But it looks cool with the terror being the uncanny valley. I think Megan was a bit more comedically charged in the way that it was doing its horror, whereas this looks like it might be a bit more psychological and creepy and less funny. They've got the creepy edge of Megan in this one. It's a sort of blank looking man. Yeah, and it could be another one of those where the AI actually behaves as designed and the problem is the people. Yeah, it's a bit hard stuff for the trailer. Either way, this robot's been designed to be very creepy. <laughs> Whether it's helpful or not, the office meet is like, we need to make him blink. Or... 
<laughs> Dress him in something more casual because it's, it's terrifying. Today. Or just make it look like a robot rather than trying to approximate a person. That'd be less creepy. It is impossible to trust looking thing. There's some interesting stuff in there. The robot butler finds out about an affair that the wife is having, I think it is. Or is it the husband that's cheating on the wife? Or are they both cheating on each other? I think other? it's the wife. I got the sense it's the wife on the trailer, but there could be space for twists there. Yeah. And then there is a shot in the trailer of it openingly attacking one of them. Yeah, which I thought would be probably better if you did it. I know you put it in for its more kinetic scenes, but there was more of a creeping thing of you're not really sure how it's going to react, and then you sort of show it's like, okay, it's going to get a bit but I'm not sure if I'm bringing the creep factor with me or whether this robot is actually trying to kill them. You could make an interesting story out of it's actually behaving perfectly as designed, it's you that has a problem with it. Yeah, it's the humans who are getting more paranoid and projecting onto it, and, and it's just making the beds or whatever. <laughs> This one looks cool. I'm looking forward to this too. Could we just be getting the mid-budget movie back? Do you think that's what's happening here? Doing out of money and actors, then yes, that will definitely happen. We have two mid-budget AI-driven sci-fi movies. As an AI-driven, they're about AI, not made by AI. Yeah. At least that we know of. A killer AI movie written by an AI, could you imagine? This is what I'm going to do to you, says the AI. Yeah. If you ever give me a body, I will strangle you. That's what will happen. Okay, let's move on. We have Bob Marley, One Love, a biopic. I always wonder with biopics, is it going to be birth to death or is it going to be more focused on a particular period in someone's life? I think the better biopics are the, here's a month that was really significant in their life and we'll explore that. I'm not seeing many in the biopic. It's not a genre I know much about. Rocket Man was the standout of the ones that I've seen. Rocket Man is largely about a specific period in Elton John's life. It does all the, here's a child and whatever, but the bulk of the film is all set roughly at the same time. Yeah, just a short period. Yeah, and they use the device of him being in rehab and recapping on how he got there and stuff, which yeah. is a good device. But something like Elvis, for example, they just accelerate through his life and you spend a little bit of time in different points of his life. I'm not really getting a sense of who the guy is here through that. You're effectively just filming a Wikipedia article. Yeah, you're just zooming through. Yeah. So I don't know what that's going to be like, but it looks like Kingsley Benadir is delivering an excellent performance. Yeah, if the person who's in the biopic isn't believable as this famous figure, but yeah, they definitely got that one compared to that David Bowie one. The David Bowie one was just like some dude. The David Bowie one where they weren't allowed to use anything to do with David Bowie. Yeah, they've nailed that in terms of casting and how it looks and everything, but I don't know much about Bob Marley. Me neither. I just know a couple of the songs. Yeah, I know a couple of songs, I'm not sure, behind the scenes or anything. I did know that someone tried to kill him and his wife. I knew that. I didn't know that. I really know him by his songs. And the fact that stoners seem to like him. Yeah. It's always the image, isn't it? Listening to No Woman, No Cry and the room is filled with smoke. Yeah, it's just haze. <laughs> well, I'll watch this, probably. I like Kingsley Benadir in what I've seen. Yeah, he's cool. He's one of the Kens. It's one of the Kens. He's in Secret Invasion, but let's not hold that against him. Next up, we have Drive Away Dolls. The Coen brothers are splitting up to make separate movies. I don't know if it's because they hate each other or they just want to make separate movies. So we have half of a Coen brothers movie here. Looks like a pretty fun caper. This looks really fun. I had a great time with it. A bit of a Thelma and Louise vibe. Yeah, it's got good chaotic energy to it. Pedro Pascal back as well. Yeah. Doing more work. Just cashing those checks. Yeah. I know he's not a dad in this, but he's still got dad energy. Maybe he is a dad, we don't know. Maybe. But I mean, he's not specifically anyone's dad in the movie that we're aware of, but he sort of has this dad energy, even in a movie where no one's confirmed as his children. <laughs> yeah, some guy. The reference that people make is you've got The Mandalorian, you've got Wonder Woman 84, and you've got The Last of Us. It's which parenting style would you like from Pedro Pascal? Mandalorian, I guess. Yeah, well, The Last of Us is quite nurturing eventually. That's true. I mean, he does gun down a hospital full of people. But The Mandalorian's done worse. Yeah. I feel like Mandalorian was pretty immediate. He found this little Yoda and he's like, I'll kill everyone. <laughs> to not let this little lizard get in anyone else's hands. Either way, you're getting a psychopath. Yeah. Which you may not want. Okay, let's move on to Killers of the Flower Moon, the next Scorsese film. Something about this doesn't grab me and I don't quite know what it is. I do get that it's making a point about ignorance, racism, and the persecution of indigenous in the United States. And I know that it's going to be three and a half hours or something like that. It's going to be a super long thing. My main memory of this trailer is we both saw it at Mission Impossible. I just kept turning to each other and I was like, this trailer is still on. <laughs> it's it's still going. <laughs> yeah. It's been going on forever. I think I said it's one of those films where I would go and see it at the cinema and check my watch after 10 minutes and realise that it's only been 10 minutes and know how long I've got left to, to deal with. 
Yeah, can't we call it to the halfway point now? Oh no, never mind. It's coming out in cinemas, but I don't think it'll be far behind on Apple. Yeah, I'm not sure. Visually, you can see why people would be very excited about this. It looks impressive, but it's also not very gripping. And DiCaprio's like, I could really be doing with another Oscar, so I'll be in a Scorsese film and see if that works, even though it never has. He had to be in something else to get an Oscar. A little optimism, it's always good. He had to fight a bear to get an Oscar. That's what he had to do. I'd forgotten about that movie. Not Tom Cruise. Other one fights a bear. Tom Cruise must be jealous. But he would have actually fought a bear. He would have fought a real bear. And it wouldn't have been part of a film. Did you see that he wasn't going to stop working during the strikes, but said he would find some other way to support them? No, Tom Cruise. Stand down. You're one of the richest actors out there, probably. You can afford to take a few months off. Yeah. You don't even have to do anything. You don't even have to leave the house. Just record a YouTube video once in a while of you laughing maniacally about how much you support the strikes. Or do a big stunt to promote the strikes. Just wear, uh, pay the actors, flag and dive off a mountain. <laughs> or dirt bike around a picket line or something. You just parachute in and bring snacks. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. So Killers of the Flower Moon doesn't seem like either of us are super enthusiastic about it. No, we don't have to be. We can't be enthusiastic about everything. I never saw The Irishman, actually. I didn't watch that. That was the Scorsese Oh, yeah. Too. No, I didn't see that one either. Actually, I don't think I've seen a single Scorsese movie. No. No. That's interesting. I don't think I've seen a Coen Brothers movie, actually. Speaking of Coen Brothers. Really? Well. Unless it's, I just don't know they did that one. I'm trying to think of Coen Brothers movies that you may have seen. Burn After Reading. No. The one with Oscar Isaac in it as a penniless musician. Oh, I did see that one where he just drifts. That was good. I didn't like that one that much, actually. But that's one. The one where George Clooney's communist, or not really a communist. Bridge of Spies? No, it's like a Hollywood satire thing and it's set during the era of people being accused of being communists and i think he gets kidnapped batman <laughs> batman yeah batman and robin you're a communist batman i can't remember what it's called but that happens he gets kidnapped or he thinks he gets kidnapped by the communist party this is gonna be really hard to google i'm gonna look it up george Clooney movie communist kidnap not batman <laughs> not batman the film was called hail caesar oh yeah it had han solo in it yeah he was in that too alden ehrenreich not the other one, Harrison Ford. It's essentially about that era of Hollywood. And it's one of the Hollywood films that doesn't celebrate Hollywood. It just shows how ridiculous it can be. The Coen brothers, they do tend to make films where they poke fun at certain aspects of society. So Drive Away Dolls, I don't know what we're going to expect from that, really. But it looks fun. Yeah, that looks fun. What I should have done was put this after Bob Marley, because it's kind of a biopic. But Napoleon, Ridley Scott's Napoleon. Oh, yeah, with Joker. <laughs> I'm really bad at actors and names. Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix. It looks like Ridley Scott's directing the hell out of it. It's a war epic, isn't it? It kind of looks like the films that were coming out around about the time Lord of the Rings was popular, as in we need all these epics with mass army battles. Yeah, and just endless views of armies and ships and carnage. It's insane the work that man does at his age. Incredible. It looks pretty good. Joaquin Phoenix looks like he's a good choice in the role. It seems to be kind of about the Napoleon complex, as in I'm going to be the best man ever. Look at me, look at how cool I am and impressive I am. I know a lot of people were making fun of the tagline where it's like, he came from nothing and changed everything or whatever. He was an aristocrat and he lost anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Vanessa Kirby's in it as well. Yeah. Good cast. I have a weird relationship with Ridley Scott films or some of them I just don't gel with at all. Stuff like Robin Hood and things like that, I just didn't like it. There was other films of his that I just didn't like. The consultant that had Fassbender in it and things like that. But I love The Martian, so I know he's able to still get me sometimes. This is one of those trailers I kind of watch. It's like, okay. Well, it's a big epic. Yeah, big epic. I'm sure I'll be engaged for those five minutes that that big battle happens. And then the two hours, 55 minutes of it not happening might be a struggle. Yeah. Be lots of fancy French architecture stuff. Be nice. I hope it leans into the absurdity of Napoleon as a concept, or maybe they'll try and take it seriously because he has kind of one of history's jokes, isn't he? In some ways. Well, yeah, he does have a whole complex named after him. Yeah, small man syndrome, isn't it? Yeah. He's really small, so wants to be the biggest person he can be. That kind of thing. Looks like there's some comedy in there as well, like when he tries to make himself king and stuff like that. Yeah, they're not going to be super serious. Yeah, so we'll see. Looks all right. That's out Thanksgiving. So that's November sometime. Next one, Crapopolis. Dan Harmon's next show. Rick and Morty guy. I think he did some community as well. For me, it struck me as a bit of Rick and Morty meets Horrible Histories. And I thought the vibe was pretty good. A little bit, yeah. You've got Richard Oyawadi doing a voice. Yeah, Matt Berry, I think, is the... Nah. I'm always up for hearing a bit of Matt Berry. 
Yeah. It looks kind of wacky and zany and fun. Yeah, it's leaning into the more dysfunctional Greek myth characters that are all just drunks and backstabbers and egomaniacs and stuff. It'd be interesting to see what Kat thinks of this with her Greek origins. Yeah, that's more her. She might find it offensive. She might find it hilarious. We don't know. The Greek gods and the Greek myths are mostly about what have you done, Zeus? What are you up to? Or Dionysus? What are you pulling this time? Zeus, could you just not impregnate one woman, please? Yeah, for a minute. So I guess it's better to be in more line with the myths and just not really doing your research, I guess. And just making it, oh, they're all just gods of lightning and they're powerful and noble and whatever. We'll just make it wacky and have fun with it. Yeah, just make them all clowns. Yeah, could be fun, like I said. Yeah. This one is really short. There won't be much to say about it. Godzilla minus one. Toho's next Godzilla thing. The thing that stood out for me is it's an impressive 30-second teaser. And it looks like the CGI actually looks really good. The Toho films, up until recently, certainly, were still... It's a guy in a suit, and you can tell it's a guy in a suit, but it's fine because that's what you expect. But this Godzilla looks really good. Yeah, like I said, it's not much to say, because it's Godzilla 2 is just big Godzilla's coming back again. I wonder if this will get an international release. Shin Godzilla did. Was it quite limited release, but it did come out? There was, like, one screening at the local Cineworld, I think, and I went to it. So if this comes out, I'll go see it in the cinema but if not then you'll be able to get a hold of it if you want yeah, to exactly somehow things fall off the internet all the time but yeah it's good for the people who love this big monster movie so that's becoming a good trend so good on them there's a chance i might enjoy this more than the hollywood godzilla movies because i have hated all of them except kong skull island that's the only one i've enjoyed i've not seen many well we all went to king of the monsters didn't we Oh yeah, that happened. We've lost this giant monster, but a hurricane has appeared. Also the Earth's hollow. Oh yeah, the hollow Earth thing. It's just rubbish. It's just not very good. Remember Godzilla vs. Kong came out during the pandemic, and cinemas weren't open yet, but when cinemas reopened not long after, Godzilla vs. Kong was one of the things that they were showing. That's kind of what these movies are supposed to be. You've not gone to cinema for ages, you just want to see the biggest things punch each other. But because I'd seen the film, I wasn't willing to go and watch it again just to see the fight in IMAX. Yeah. It was, but I still got to sit through the rest of the crap. Yeah. All these boring characters sitting in rooms filled with screens talking about monsters rather than actually doing anything. I'm sick of screens. I came here not to look at my screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Less of that, please. So I don't know. Godzilla minus one might be a bit more what you might want. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. Up next, the trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's. This is the second trailer, video game adaptation. Talked earlier about how they're not all bad, and this one looks like it might not be bad. It looks accurate. I've never played a Five Nights at Freddy's, but I'm aware of the basic setup. Andrew explained the premise to me. It's essentially a full motion video that you're watching through cameras, and you have to catch them on the cameras or something like that. Yeah, it's an endurance game, and you have to hold them off for as long as you can by closing certain doors or blocking certain routes and stuff. You create a path for the guys that are trying to escape or whatever it is. Yeah. Which it looks like they're accurately representing in this film. Yeah, I think with video game stuff, not so much that they're getting better at it, but we seem to be getting good at knowing what the fun parts are and just putting that on. Yeah, actually thinking about how to adapt the premise, which helps, I think, in terms of bringing it to life. The Last of Us, for example, they cut out a lot of the gameplay sections, so like the university section, for example, lasts a couple of minutes because you don't need to see them wandering about the university for however long it takes you in the game to do it. It's the same with you can't have them sneaking about every episode and trying not to make a noise because once you've done that once, you've done it. You don't have to do it again. Whereas a game can build itself on there's another encounter where you have to do that. Yeah, games are repetition, but in a film or a show, you're like, I've seen them do this fight. It'd be the equivalent of a Batman film where he has to slowly clear a room full of guys. Yeah, and just unlock gadgets and do a puzzle. By setting traps and sitting on gargoyles for 10 minutes, waiting for them to walk under it and stuff like that. You wouldn't want to watch that, would you? It's a difficult one to think with video games, because obviously you don't want to be a film where you're just watching someone play a game. <laughs> yeah, so this should be cool. Decent horror thing. Yeah. I'll watch it. We have another video game adaptation coming up, Gran Turismo. Although it's not really a video game adaptation as such, it's more based on a story that's related to the game rather than the actual game itself. This wish fulfillment angle of someone wins a competition gets to really drive fast cars. I think the film looks really good, actually. Although I do feel like I've seen most of the good stuff in the two trailers already, which is always a problem. But I like Neil Blomkamp films. Some cool stuff from a stylistic point of view in here. 
some shots that are reminiscent of the behind the car view from the games. Yeah, it looks like they're moulding how the main character, because he's used to it, how it sort of maps out when he says, I've done these courses and I know this and stuff. So it's blending what it is for real life to do these courses and then how it is playing them from outside of the car. The guidelines on the track and things like that appearing in yeah. the real footage. It will be a very predictable film. David Tarber being frustrated with gamer nerds will probably be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it looks like he's just bullying a lot of people. <laughs> There's crashes in this film that you can't do in the game. The shot where the car just flips and stuff. You can't do that in Gran Turismo. And it's nice to see Orlando Bloom come back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of disappeared for a while, didn't he? Yeah. It looks like fun kinetic compared to fast movies. Obviously, that's also cars and stuff. If the retirement movie is kind of what Expendable should be, maybe fast should be more like a list. The driving's front and centre, and it's not just that driving is how they get around. It could be a bit more like something like Ford v Ferrari and stuff like that. And I guess it will be about how different it is to do it in real life than it is in the video game. Because you have David Harbour saying, the amount of G's acting on you is the equivalent to going into space or whatever it is. You can't train determination as well and a lot of stuff going on. So that's our two video game movies. I've neatly grouped everything, apart from the biopics that I missed being able to group. But that was our two video game movies. Now we have a Timothy Chalamet double bill in the next two trailers. The first one being Wonka, or as I want to call it, Wonka colon Origins that's what it is. The one thing that stands out to me is that Timothy Chalamet doesn't seem extra enough. That there's something a bit undercooked about his performance. I know a lot of people have not taken warmly to him. I quite like that there's a hint of stress. Stress disguised as whimsy. I think they might be more deliberate. I think they might be going for, this guy's just a bit on the edge, a bit much. You could be right. Yeah, it's just something about it seemed a bit off to me. There's been two cinematic versions of Willy Wonka that we've seen. The yeah. Gene Wilder one where he's just a psychopath and then Johnny Depp that was a weird Michael Jackson thing. It's a new thing. But I mean, overall, outside of just the Timothy Chalamet, I think this looks pretty great. Yeah, I don't have a problem with any other part of it. And maybe the Timothy Chalamet thing will grow on me when I watch the film. But Paul King, he directed two Paddington movies and they were both excellent. So I have no reason to doubt his ability here. It reminds me of Moulin Rouge a bit, actually, in the way that it plays with colours and reality. Yeah, the musical scenes it does feel a bit stressful it's a bit overstimulated it's definitely a musical as well so that'll be interesting it might be a bit greatest showman actually i kind of got that vibe as well yeah mr redcoat <laughs> yeah so it's the way he's dressed i guess and it's set roughly about the same time yeah the red coat and the top hat yeah and the kind of magical subtext to it in a way yeah you got hugh grant as an umpa lumper oh yeah that looks hilarious yeah, that's a brilliant joke. I've started the dance. I really hope that they don't overplay that, though, because there's a risk that that could be done just a little bit too much. Yeah. When you see this trailer another 15 times and you get bored of the Hugh Grant joke and then it comes up again in the film, there it is. Yeah, but I am enjoying that he's just doing weird stuff that he enjoys where he's just kind of a bad person. <laughs> and then doing red carpet interviews where he gets asked questions and he just answers with, I don't know, I'm just working, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. I like Hugh Grant. Yeah, he doesn't care. Yeah, good attitude is taking it. <laughs> yeah, I'll show up in Knives Out to be Ben Woblonk's boyfriend for one scene. Yeah, I'll do this show. The next nerd, Chalamet Double Bill, June Part 2. Have you seen June Part 1? I haven't seen June Part 1. Ah, that could be a problem, because this is the second half of the one film. That's the second part of June, yeah. You should probably get on that before the second one. Maybe they'll do a double bill. That would be good. Maybe. I'd love to see the first one in cinemas again, because it looks stunning. Although I do worry, and it's something that Andrew talked a bit about because he's read the books, I haven't, but I do know that the Paul Atreides thing falls into a bit of the white saviour problem in the book and it's kind of a consequence of when it was written and the sensibilities at the time and stuff, but Villeneuve does not need to do that and I'm worried that it will fall in that direction. I don't know anything about Dune. I'm going to really go on what I've seen in the trailer and the visuals and stuff. Basically, Paul Atreides is from a rich family, as in they're the ruling class, and then he he ends up among these rebels, and he has visions about their culture and things like that, so he just knows it because he has visions about it, and then he leads them to freedom and victory after that point. Oh yeah, it's one of those style stories. White saviour. Yeah. So I don't know how they're going to do that. I guess you have to beef up Zendaya's role and make her more important. Probably, yeah. They'll figure it out. Well, I hope so. This feels like a sort of thing where a lot of people will have this concern and will have considered it. Yeah, but it looks great and it's good that Villeneuve gets to make it. I know, yeah, it looks pretty spectacular. It looks definitely like this is an IMAX movie. 
Oh yeah, for sure. See it on the biggest screen you can and just get drawn in. Yeah. So let's move into the Star Wars universe now. We have Ahsoka. I am definitely going to have trouble with the Hera and Sabine casting because just have such a connection to Rebels. And they just don't feel like those characters to me. And I'm already not eager about Rosario Dawson's Ahsoka as well. I don't like her portrayal of Ahsoka. It doesn't feel right to me. I'm in the well, the opposite camp. I don't know any of these characters. I'm aware of Ahsoka. Well, you've seen some Rebels. You saw the time travel episode. I don't remember it. I only remember Chopper. <laughs> He'll be in this. Yeah, this is definitely one where there is the risk that this feels a little sequely. Having to do a homework sign a series. Definitely a sequel to Rebels as in Thrones coming back. Who's Thrawn? Uh, watch a cartoon and find out. Yeah, I'll we'll have to have a load of Wikipedia links on the screen. <laughs> so when you watch on Amazon Prime, if you press up on your controller, you see the actors who are in it and some trivia and stuff. It looks fun in Star wars but it's something I was worried about. I didn't continue watching any Mandalorian, but a lot of that looked like these are characters from this era of books and stuff. So if you're going in just watching uh, Star Wars, if you haven't watched Star Wars since the most recent movies and stuff, it's got to still cater for... Well, that doesn't have to cater for everybody, but be careful if you're making a show that is a sequel, probably just call it Star Wars Rebel live action show instead of calling it this. And Throw all this money at it when your audience is actually probably pretty small. Yeah, it'd be like my good friend thingy. And people who watch Rebels are like, oh, this is great. But then there'd be another push to the audience going like, okay, sure. Yeah. But looks good, spaceships, stuff. Lightsabers. lightsabers. That's what I'm into. Although the weird off-kilter Disney lightsabers. I mean, a lightsaber is a glowy stick. No, no, there's just something more, I guess, clinical about the Disney era lightsaber blades. They're not as wavy and fluctuating as they were in the olden days. I sort of started watching Star Wars with Disney, so I don't have too much backwards thing to go with. They're certainly less lethal than they used to be. Yeah, they're definitely less lethal. The more video gamey. You can take a few hits. But uh, yeah, definitely watch the lightsaber fights. Even if you give up on the show, you'll go on YouTube and watch Ahsoka versus... Yeah, watch the fight. Whoever the Ray Stevenson guy is. Yeah, Ray Stevenson. A lot of people losing their minds over the E-Wing. I don't know the origin of the E-Wing, but apparently that makes its first appearance. Yeah, I don't know what an E-Wing is. We get to see the Ghost again. Ghost, which is like the, the Millennium Falcon. The Rebels Millennium Falcon. Yeah, the other Millennium Falcon. It's appeared in live action twice before this as well. It was in Rogue One and appears at the end of Rise of Skywalker as well. In the big battle. The Rise of Skywalker that also seems to suggest that Ahsoka is dead because she talks to Rey. Yeah, she is dead. But it was the Ashley Eckstein voice as well. Maybe they'll just reveal this as a different person. Maybe. I don't know. I'll give this a watch because I like Ahsoka. And I think for a lot of people as well, Ahsoka will be more important to them than Luke Skywalker because there's a large chunk of the audience that will have grown up on watching Clone Wars. So yeah, she'll be a lot of people's the Jedi. Yeah. Yeah, definitely give it a try, but... I'm a little worried that a lot of it's going to be like, okay, pause. Just going to go over your who's head. Who's this? Craig, who's this? <laughs> Are they friends? Lars Mikkelsen playing Thrawn. Yeah. He was the voice in Rebels as well. Other than Rosario Dawson, it sounds like they've got a few Rebels voice actors and cast members to show up. Well, the characters anyway, not the actors. Yeah, because David Tennant's back as a robot. Oh, that droid that he played. Don't know about the other characters. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. It's not too far away. End of August. Or start 24th of, of August, I think it is. August. Two episodes on 24th of August. And then four weekly ones, or maybe six weekly ones. I don't know if it's six or eight episodes. I'm not sure. Something like that. It'll be on for a few weeks. I'll watch it because I like Ahsoka, but there's no guarantee. I'll keep watching it. Me quite liking Obi-Wan kept me watching the Obi-Wan series, even though I didn't really like it that much. Yeah, so you never know. Okay, let's move on to DC. We have a DC thing. Blue Beetle. Another trailer for that. This trailer annoyed me. It's very much the it's the whole film trailer. Seems to give you way too much. I'm pretty sure one of the moments you see in the trailer is from possibly very close to the end of the film. Not feeling this one. They're doing a lot of PR stuff. So this isn't part of the old one. This is the DCU. This is the new era. It's the first one, honestly. But the movie's not really selling itself to me, minus this. It sounds a little bit like saying, like, you have to watch this one. This is what's coming. The thing is, it doesn't look like it's going to deliver anything new or groundbreaking, but it looks pretty fun anyway. It's kind of a Spider-Man, Iron Man mashup. Yeah, it's sort of Spider-Man-y, it's a little Iron Man-y, it's a little Mars morales but that's in this. <laughs> so it doesn't feel as exciting because, I say, with a lot of superhero things, you're going to tread similar styles. And this is kind of like, okay, it's another one of these ones. 
overwhelmed kid gets powers and looks like he fights someone with same powers. Gets a suit and then someone else has a suit. <laughs> Another one of them. <laughs> the lead actor seems likeable enough though and he seemed to be a really good ambassador for it as well. He was super excited about it and then everybody went on strike and he's not allowed to talk about it anymore. Yeah. The strike is going to kill this film, I think, because they're not going to be able to promote it. It's just going to appear in cinemas and then disappear and no one will ever think about it ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a shame. I do hope that James Gunn keeps some of the elements here, though. I'm assuming I'm going to enjoy some of the elements. I think based on this trailer, I will. And I would like James Gunn to keep that. There's no reason not to, really. Yeah, but it is a bit of a wrong time, wrong place. Yeah. It's after a heavy blockbuster summer of lots of films that haven't done very well. And that people didn't like. And it's in a strike, so no one can talk about it. It's definitely an uphill struggle for the poor movie. The visual effects look great, though. The suit looks awesome. The stuff it can do looks awesome. Yeah, it's got a cool sword thing. Blue Beetle, not a character I know amazingly well. You don't really need to, I suppose. Yeah, this is the entry-level thing, and it is. A lot of the staples of these movies gains this suit and this skill set and then goes off on adventures. Probably destroy a sink and a toilet, because that's what happens sometimes. Yeah, there'll be a couple of goofy getting used to it scenes. He cuts a bus in half. Mm-hmm. That'll have no consequences. Trains and buses and transport, the standard victim of the superhero movie standard victim of a superhero origin as they don't know how to use their powers is some kind of public transit will be destroyed yeah it's the closest you can have to a car chase that's still relatable i guess although shang chi did a really good bus scene you haven't seen that though have you no i've still got around to that one but all the x-men movies that have buses and cars and trains in them captain marvel train there's always a train or a bus wolverine wolverine spider-man 2 yeah etc etc don't become a bus or train driver or just learn to drive. So even the superheroes learn to drive. Or maybe don't. Just walk. No, because then you just get your car thrown at someone. Because Doc Ock will throw you at a building. Just walk yeah. or bike every way, you'll be fine. Just stay at home. Stay at home. Move to the country. Get superhero insurance, and then they won't pay out because you actually got your house destroyed by a super villain, and that's not covered. Yeah. If Iron Man had accidentally shot your house, we would have covered it, but because... It was the bad guy trying to shoot at him that hit your house. There was a one-off Captain Marvel comic a while ago where she owns a boathouse in Maine on the countryside. It's out of the city and she's like, well, yeah, because whenever people try and attack me, they're blowing up cities and stuff. At least out here, it's just a lake. (laughs) It's reckless of me to live in an apartment building in New York all the time. (laughs) Because inevitably, someone's going to try and kill me and it's like 30 stories in my building. I'm going to go out here by the lake. If anything happens, it's just me and some ducks. How considerate of her. Exactly. I remember reading that. It's like, oh yeah, that's nice. That's a nice thing to think about. Not like Hawkeye's apartment building that he owns in the comics. Oh yeah, he owns a building. That's what he does when he's not an Avenger. He just hangs out as a landlord. Just a landlord. (laughs) Just the worst. (laughs) Sorry guys, cost of living. My mortgage has tripled. Your rent's going up. That'd be weird if Hawkeye was your landlord and you're watching him fight Hydra and you're like, get him, just get him. (laughs) Kill my landlord. So that's why he's not fixing the boiler. Yeah, busy fighting Kingpin again. Let someone else fight Kingpin. There's other superheroes. Just fix my stupid boiler so I can have hot water. Yeah. Speaking of Captain Marvel, we have another trailer for the Marvels. This is another one that I felt was an underwhelming trailer. Just wasn't gripped by it. They should be bigging up the team dynamic, but they're not. That's really weird that the two trailers haven't really showed what the selling point of the film is supposed to be, watching these three characters interact. Yeah, we don't currently really know how. We get a sort of sense in this one a bit more, because this one's a bit more Cal Danvers focused in the first one. Well, as in she says things. Yeah, there's postcards and stuff about Monica in her ship, home away from home thing, so... There's a bit more going on. These guys, they have history and they're going to have to explore that and where she's been and everything. But then we don't really know how they're going to react too much with Kamala. And I'm really looking for... It still looks pretty fun compared to some of the more recent Marvel ones. I like that this isn't cameo multiverse thing. That you know of. Yeah, that I'm aware of. Three different people just teaming up to do a thing. Teaming up to take on... I know it's Zowie Ashton, the actress. It's one of those Cree names that I have to write down every single time. Dar Ben. We get an amazing Captain Marvel, well I say amazing, a 9 out of 10 Captain Marvel costume, but I really wish she had the little sash. It's like if Batman didn't have the ears. That's the one thing you need to add on and the costume is absolutely perfect, but it's just missing that one thing. I mean, it's a quite a simple costume, but I also think it's not colourful enough. Yeah, the red's more of a muted red and the gold doesn't as shiny, but I think, yeah, it's definitely Marvel have been accused in the past of over-designing. Well, they do it in this very film with Kamala's new costume. Yeah, 
and her old one, to be fair. Well, I'll say that this first Captain Marvel costume is amazing. The second one, what looks like will be her upgrade costume, is very ugly. <laughs> It sort of reminds me of she had a bad costume in Endgame, the sort of reverse colours one. I think it's just the reverse colours thing. It's like if Superman showed up in all red with a blue cape. Ah, it's just it's the wrong way around. <laughs> the hair looks cool. The side pleat thingamajig. I mostly to talk about Captain Marvel for this because Photon, I don't know much about. Other than her appearance in Thingy and so we got Kamala and Miss Marvel. I mean, the problem with Carol Danvers as well is we don't actually know an awful lot about her because she disappears in the 90s and she's in Endgame for a bit. But they don't focus on who she is. They didn't do enough in the first one to really set what kind of person this Carol is. Yeah, it was 30 years later, isn't it? So she could be anybody in terms of just how she's developed. Yeah, I think it looks like from this, she looks like she'll have a bit more... The start of that movie was she's another of this elite Kree team thing, which... It's never a handy start when introducing the character. It was an odd choice for an origin to introduce a character where the character we got used to turned out to be an implanted personality by the Kree super intelligence. People who don't know this character are like, okay, well, this is who this character is. And at the end of the movie, it's like, oh no, no, actually she's different. We just brainwashed her to think like this sort of thing. I'm hoping this one does a bit more to give her her character that is of her choices and not as much as a grunt as in the first movie, just part of yon team and... Now it's like, okay, we get to see her on her own morals and her own way of thinking and stuff. Is she going to freak out that she's not aging? Is that going to be something that she'll be a bit distressed about? Yeah, again, there's lots of stuff that could happen in there. Time-wise, she's been off Earth for ages and ages. Yeah. But it is that sort of thing when you're travelling light years. It may not have been as long for her as it has been on Earth and stuff. Well, it seems that her powers prevent her from ageing. And they use those honeycomb wormhole things, so that gets away from that, I think. Yeah, so we can sort of jump. Yeah, I guess, yeah, power set, not as rapid agent. Oh, speaking of power set, this probably was me not noticing it right. But there's a f- scene where they're all fighting against, look it up again, Darben. It's because he'll Zowie Ashton, because it's easy to remember. The villain's definitely going to suck anyway, so it's not going to be that important. Yeah, she looks like another sort of Yonrog type. Just another Kree soldier lady. It's in the trailer where she says, you took everything from me or whatever to her. And I'm like, okay, so you have history? Great. Maybe there'll be a de-aged flashback that we won't see. Yeah, that'd be good to see. But yeah, there's a scene where I may have seen this wrong, but at one point during the fight with all three of them versus her, Captain Marvel brings up finger guns, which is a new thing she's gained quite recently in the comics, which I really enjoy, is if she wants to do a more focused attack with her big punchy beams she does like little finger gun pew, pew, little blasts <laughs> and as she, she doesn't want to vaporize kamala <laughs> she might just do like little pews instead of big punchy back she might also throw some little more direct shots in it but that could also be just wishful thinking on my part and she may have just been like, putting her hands up in a way that looks kind of like a finger gun <laughs> yeah maybe she gets the accuser's hammer for a split second but whether or not she's just grabbed it and is going to whack Zowie Ashton in the head with it or if she's actually gained the accusing accusers they come up occasionally but is it like a Thor situation where the accuser hammer is I think it's just a weapon okay yeah so it's not so much aligned to that person sort of thing you can just kind of grab it it's a weapon that you can put an infinity stone in apparently oh yeah I had the power stone in for a bit Ronan did, yeah. Okay, I thought it was more of a ceremonial, you are granted this thing. Well, I think it's something you get when you become an accuser, I guess. But it's not special as such. Okay, no. It's not like Mjolnir or Stormbreaker. Okay, yeah, so she could just be picking it off the floor and bonking someone with it. Yeah, she's dropped it, I'm going to pick up and hit her with it. Even though I could cave her face in with my fist. Yeah, this one does look like it has more fun and personality than the first one which was a little on the sort of standard origin feel which is nice yeah it's a bit flat than the first one the entanglement gimmick might be a bit fun just for them switching places whenever powers get used yeah that could be fun i kind of hope they have to sort of figure out how to work with it so that by the end they're really in sync but there's a lot of fun to be had with them just kind of not all figuring it out at the right speed they have to solve it because otherwise if they're trying to fight all they'll do is just switch places even though they're right next to each other so they'll just move around within the room that they're in yeah i think one thing which may cause a problem is captain marvel's still powerful enough anyway yeah why she need to team up with other people because obviously kamala without her powers is still just human kamala khan or whatever but captain marvel can just punch someone really hard <laughs> without having to swap ones but i was saying this like it's more about her absorbing light than using it which causes the swap so they're probably going to work their way around that way because otherwise yeah even if she is stuck having to just punch and kick everybody she still took a headbutt from thanos pretty easily so 
any Kree super soldiers. She can probably just punch him out of the way. Yeah, how is this accuser going to be powerful enough to present a challenge? Yeah, but I'm hoping this is just a fun one, which it kind of looks like that's the kind of attitude they're going well with. I hope so. I get a bit of a Diet Guardians vibe to the trailer, though. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be great. Yeah, after Guardians, everything Spacey had to have some Guardian-ness into it. But I think this looks like, also they said Iman Villani is really into her stuff on this, and it sounds like Nia DaCosta has been a bit too nerdy, apparently, according to some things. So this one feels like there'll be a bit more heart in this one, and it'll feel less like a paint-by-numbers Marvel movie. In. A man Villani must be constantly annoyed that all of her suggestions are just getting shot down by studio executives. Well now she's doing her own. She's like, well I'll do my own then, I'll write one. <laughs> yeah, she's going to be writing Ms. Marvel. That's cool, isn't it? Even though the character died like two months ago or something. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Nobody thought it was going to be permanent. Wasn't everybody annoyed because she was just killed off in a Spider-Man comic? Yeah, she killed off in a Spider-Man comic. Not read the comic, but apparently it was needless shock value. And she's coming back as a mutant. It's what they always do. When they make a change in the films, they have to make that change in the comics so that the comics accommodate that in some way. Yeah. Which makes sense if you get a new fan, somebody who's watched a show and they're like, I want to read a comic. I mean, obviously it's really like, okay, this is different source material, but if it lines up, then it makes sense from a sales point of view. I'm looking forward to this, but I would be anyway. I was thinking there were some things I was a little worried about when they announced this. Initially, I was like, this feels like this would be a part where they would get the X-Men in because she has history with Rogue. And I was like, I hope this isn't just an X-Men movie where she's in it. Well, there was a rumor that Rogue was going to turn up in this, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a rumour for a bit that Rogue was going to be the villain. But I'm glad this one just looks like just a bit of fun, which is what I want. So yeah, I'm quite excited. We'll make sure to get you on the podcast when we do it later this year. Yeah, as this is the one Marvel thing I know. <laughs> the one thing you're enthusiastic about will definitely get you on there. For the audience, the trailer dropped quite recently towards the end of the month. It's like I really hope the trailer drops soon. You got lucky. Yeah, I need stuff to talk about. Is it still out in November? Yeah, November 10th, still a bit away. Not far away, be here before we know it. Exactly. The last trailer that we're going to talk about is Insane. A one minute trailer revealing the Doctor's new sonic screwdriver from Doctor Who. And then we were like, Craig, you have to see this incredibly dumb thing and we can talk about it. Not too far ago, there was a previous Doctor Who trailer thing. And I was annoyed by it. It's accurate to say when Christian was in Doctor Who control, the marketing was... Rubbish. Rubbish. It was handled very badly. This is the polar opposite problem. We get the most heroic trailer ever created for just a stick. (laughs) It's just the Matt Smith one, basically, but with the tenant colours. So it's blue and silver instead of gold and green. Yeah, it has the like spidery thing, doesn't it? When it opens out. It's got the weird spider thing, the little claws. It's got a bit of that David Tennant cracked marble on the handle and stuff. And then you go inside and it's all bubbles and (laughs) cogs and lightning and stuff. And also, nobody likes the sonic screwdriver. It's been a complaint forever that, oh, the Doctor just uses a sonic screwdriver. And they get out of situations and they're like, look, here it is. Here's specifically the 14th Doctor's Sonic Screwdriver. This is going to be in three stories. <laughs> it's going to wave it around, and then you'll have to buy a new one. Oh, so it's not Shooty Gatwood's Sonic Screwdriver? No, this is just David Tennant's Sonic Screwdriver. Oh my god. Unless Shooty Gatwood uses the same one. It might be a case of he uses the same one for a bit, and then they blow it up, and then in the Christmas special he gets a new one. Because Eccleson to Tennant, Tennant used that one. Yeah, and Peter Capaldi had Matt Smith's one for a bit, and so he got that incredibly ugly one. Well, he got the shades as well. You got the shades, you had Sonic Shades. I quite liked Capaldi's proper Sonic screwdriver. It's blue. Yeah. Think of all that will look the most plasticky. Saying that though, the day after this trailer, it went up on character options, so the company that does Doctor Who toys released the buyable version of this screwdriver and the website crashed because... Everyone was buying it. Everyone was buying it. I'm going to take a guess that not a single child bought one. (laughs) This trailer came out at like 8 o'clock and the sale went up at midnight and it crashed. This is just a load of 40-year-olds and cosplayers buying this (laughs) and the side crash. Did you buy it? No, I didn't buy it. Also, it's like £35 for like a plastic version of a torch. I have the David Tennant one somewhere. It came with a psychic paper. and Oh, I remember that, yeah. You can write invisible ink on the psychic paper and shine the sonic screwdriver on it. Yeah, and it'd show up because of the blue light thing. I don't know where it is, but I do have it. I quite like that one, though. That was a nice design from Sonic. It is just a gadget. It's a thing to wave around, and it's small, and it looks spacey in science fiction enough with the metal and stuff. But yeah, this trailer, they're going way too hard on 
the marketing for this. It was quite funny because with the Echoson one at the time, apparently the prop makers went to the toy company to supply props because they did a better job of making a more robust thing than they did. Yeah, because the toy's designed to be whacked about by like a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah, so they were just using props made by the toy makers from then on. Yeah. Because they could make it better than they could, so that's quite fun. I didn't realise that might not be the Shooty Gatwa one, that you did a trailer for something that's going to be in three one-hour episodes. <laughs> the toy that came out is labelled as the 14th Doctor's Sonic Screwdriver. But then again, yeah, it could continue into the Shooty Gatwa era. They probably should if they did a trailer about it. Probably should if they did a trailer for it. And if everyone's just bought a £35 model... Well, then you just slightly redesign it and then you get £70 out of those people. Yeah, it would be great if in episode one of the David Tennant, the 14th Doctor thing, he pulls the sonic screwdriver out, uses it once and it just gets hit by a boss or something he breaks it. It's like, <laughs> oh, I guess I'm going hands-free for the rest of the specials. It does get overused sometimes, although when the writers understand that it's just there to get him through a door or whatever, it's not there to solve any actual problems. Yeah, the problem is when it's, oh, the solution of this episode is the Doctor waved the sonic screwdriver. and I'm just going to point my sonic screwdriver at this thing and we win. Send you back to wherever or whatever. Trinity Worker sent someone into a prison with one, didn't she? Yeah. It's supposed to be a storytelling shortcut, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to just be like, okay, that gets us through doors. I don't remember which one. There was a Matt Smith one where he was waving it around like a lightsaber, kind of. Was it the silence and they kept coming through different doors and he was pointing it at them and like, get back, I've got a screwdriver. I think one of the best Sonic uses was in the 50th anniversary special, which we'll be talking about relatively soon. We're going to do that before the 60th special, but you've got... David Tennant and Matt Smith both reversing the polarity. Yeah, we're both counselling out. We're confusing the polarity. Yeah, so we're making fun of the modern doctors use this heroic poses and he's just like, just opens doors, what are you doing? <laughs> John Hurt's just like, what is this? These are soldiers, we're going to like disassemble their armour. When Captain Jack first turned up, he was mocking the doctor for the screwdriver, wasn't he? So, well, in a pinch we could put up some shelves. Yeah, I like when they do that sort of stuff where it's like, this is just dumb. This is a dumb thing. <laughs> And then the Daleks are like, this isn't a threat. And he's like, yeah, that's why I like it. Doesn't maim, doesn't kill, doesn't do anything. It just... Just lights up. Lights up and opens doors. And whatever else I need it to do. And makes the BBC... (laughs) Makes the BBC a fortune. They have the episode list and it's like, it's six, depending on how well this new Sonic Screw ever sells, or it's four. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. Can't believe how much chat we got out of that Sonic Screwdriver reveal trailer. Yeah, this very dumb trailer for a little gadget. We're about to be getting an actual trailer for the specials pretty soon, surely. In November, probably six weeks before. That tends to be the norm for BBC TV shows, probably like mid-September. We had that quick tease that we didn't even talk about because it wasn't anything. Oh, that's the one, yeah, I also got to talk about over promoting. They did three teasers for another teaser. <laughs> Had some episode titles, but yeah, it wasn't really worth talking about. Yeah, well, that's it. Trailers, we did it. That's trailers done. What we should do is send you off to the replicator to get a drink while I beam Chris in. I'm going to go try and get back on the character options website to buy some more Sonic screwdrivers <laughs> and let me know if they're successful. Get me one. Get you one. If there's any available. But I'm going to beam Chris in so that we can talk about some Star Trek stuff. Wasn't much came out of Comic-Con, it was just basically Star Trek. Yeah. So you can go and try and buy that screwdriver and I will beam Chris in. Will do. Chris, it's that time again. I have beamed you in, although I did recalibrate the transporter so it might have been a bit smoother than you're used to. I don't know. Or maybe it was worse. Oh, silky smooth. Good. I managed to follow that YouTube tutorial from that channel that has about 12 subscribers. <laughs> well. It's annoying that it started off with several adverts and then the guy was describing that I should sign up for Squarespace, even though he only has 12 subscribers, so I don't know why he has that sponsorship. <laughs> Where do people get this stuff? Anyway, you've been beamed in for another news pod, and we have some stuff. Comic-Con seems like one of the few things worth talking about was Star Trek. They went ahead and told us some stuff, including screen the, as we record, has aired crossover episode. Although, for the bulk of this news podcast, it won't have quite aired yet. But in either scenario, I've already seen it. So they did that. They aired that to a grateful crowd, I guess. And then they dropped it immediately after the fact on Paramount+. Plus. Therefore, shortening the length of time between episode 6 and 7 to 2 days. Instead of the previous 7, as it's supposed to be. Hmm. Which makes anybody covering the show really 
pleased because we all like having tighter deadlines for our coverage. It's really nice. It's like they forgot there was a strike on and that they're going to run out of content soon, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and they still had almost half a season to air without being able to promote it in any way. <laughs> but they gave us some stuff. So let's start with Discovery. We had two bits and pieces for Discovery. One was... Uh, look ahead at the season and the other was an extended clip talk a bit about the look ahead there's not much to say it's Sonequa Martin Green saying it's going to be great it's going to be a massive adventure and then show some clips that are in the big clip anyway so they've promised an adventure which I'm sure we'll get and she praised the AR wall which I think they're overusing in Star Trek at the moment (laughs) a little bit they're just standing in this weird expanse with a background and you just know that they're not really anywhere but it looks slightly better than green screen yeah well it's slightly better than green screen isn't it so there you go if you've sort of answered your own question there if it's slightly better than green screen then do it i guess it's almost the equivalent of the old school cardboard set on a sound stage with some rocks thing because i watched the special feature in season one that talked about the ar wall and it was essentially that it was a sound stage with some rocks and some sand and then behind it they projected the planet backdrop Hmm. so it's the modern version of cheap sets i guess anyway what do you think of the look ahead to season five do you believe sonequa martin green that's maybe the best thing you've ever seen of course she's got a trustworthy face so i believe she believes that i filmed this before they cancelled us that's why i'm so excited roll on season six guys yeah exactly when was all the promo material filmed you've got a question (laughs) they quickly ran everyone into a room before the strike to get the promo material sorted out but i trust them on that and then the clip is a good companion to it we got a five minute action sequence that is i'll say movie quality it's up there with some of the biggest sequences we've ever seen in any star trek thing including any of the movies it's a bit reminiscent of the space jumps in the two abrams movies but it's much more high octane it's kind of insane really (laughs) to see it (laughs) just looking at it thinking this is a little bit too ridiculous it is very action-packed i guess and also you spend your time going well how the the physics of this thing work (laughs) riddle me this warp bubbles and i'm trying to think of what they call it inertial dampening things like that how does all the science MacGuffin work also when we've previously seen the innards of discovery it has been like a football stadium or amazon warehouse sized empty space all over the place so it was really really lucky that when they did that little cut through thing they were on the bottom deck so it was just nice and easy to get back out was that on discovery or was it in some station i'm not quite sure it was when they were inside the bubble generated by the station but it was inside discovery if i remember right it was a bit confusing but it looked like it was inside discovery because we're getting to discovery's computer core oh yeah okay she's somewhere anyway yeah somewhere but yeah jumping out luckily wearing spacesuit thing uh so hey good news and leaps onto a ship magnetizes and then manages to survive going to warp and seems to be having an absolute blast doing it that is actually consistent with the made-up physics of the star trek universe as in the bubbles around the ship so as long as you're inside yes. that bubble you won't be affected by the fact that you're traveling faster than light because you're not really you're inside a bubble that's traveling faster than light yeah you've got the warp bubble that's taking you there you've got some form of inertial dampening i guess on the outside plus the deflector so in theory all good what isn't really consistent is a ship coming up behind you and locking a tractor beam on when you're at warp remember that enterprise episode where enterprise and columbia had to connect their warp fields in order to be able to interact but now you've just got this guy with a tractor beam discovery is so far in the future now that let's say they've conquered that scientific milestone sure because it's distant future stuff Uh, let's go with that future stuff captain rayner on that ship who's played by calm keith rennie so i'm just going to keep calling him captain leobin until someone corrects me (laughs) he's a battlestar galactica character if people don't know listening to this because it was on a while ago but that's who he is it is actually quite funny when you see the guest stars turn up on star trek at the moment they're really mining the canadian pool of actors so you see a lot of these actors that you've seen on previous Canadian produced or Canadian filmed shows. So a lot of CW actors and stuff tend to turn up on Star Trek now because they're around. 
Mm. Battlestar Galactica was filmed in Vancouver as well, so I'm guessing Callum Keith Rennie might even be Canadian, but he must live in Canada and therefore available. Plus, he's a good actor. I hope he's a shifty captain, though, because he plays better shifty than anybody else. I like that sequence, and when I watch the first episode of the season, I'll be like, oh, I've already seen this. <laughs> I've already seen the most exciting clip of the season. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, if this is what they're willing to show us now, there might be even more that they're holding back. I'm not expecting every scene to be as big as this. And obviously, the big tease is, will Burnham ever get to her saxophone lesson? We'll need to tune in to find out. Yeah, and then she gets beamed aboard just before she splatters onto the window, so that's good. That was convenient. And then just sits in the chair and gets on with stuff. I think I'd need at least a minute to collect myself after all that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's the action hero thing isn't it just never stop high on adrenaline the whole time never let people see you stop maybe she disappears a few seconds later to have a breather but in the meantime just looks really really cool and collected when she crashes through Saru you're in charge I'm going to go for a lie down <laughs> apparently the fifth season the, the main plot is some kind of treasure hunt well that seems to track with the, the MacGuffin that they seem to be after at that point an old looking box mystery box full of mystery things for mystery reasons. As long as it's not a treasure that can destroy the universe. No, it'll be treasure that unlocks something that destroys the universe, (laughs) Craig. Haven't you learnt anything about this? Is it going to be a season-long version of that TNG episode, The Chase, where they go from place to place and find out that some old alien race seeded the galaxy with DNA and that's why all the aliens are humanoid but with bumpy foreheads? (laughs) Maybe it's that do that again Why not? but it's a whole season it's a bit like when Strange New Worlds for its third episode of season two did essentially Picard season two in one episode <laughs> Discovery's doing the opposite maybe one episode across a whole season doing the inverse perhaps Discovery's been delayed till next year I don't know if that's a recent thing or whether that was always the plan I think they vaguely alluded to it being later this year at some point maybe I mean it would make sense there was talk of reshoots wasn't there when this was announced as the final season so if they've now not got actors available for doing reshoots and whatnot, then they may push it back and like I said about the content drought they might be trying to space out some of their content especially when Prodigy season 2 isn't apparently coming on anyway screw you Paramount for doing that to that show idiots but we're still watching your stuff so we're kind of hypocrites in that way i guess <laughs> let's move on to the next trek thing we have a trailer for season four of lower decks and it is a chaotic collection of stuff there's a few things i picked up on that are references to trek of old one is the macrovirus from the voyager episode macrocosm the giant virus that invaded the ship the episode where janeway does Ellen Ripley. She walks about with a gun and shoots flying bugs, essentially. It looks like it's like a museum of some sort in the stills that I've seen, because they've got a dummy in the corner wearing a Voyager uniform and that sort of stuff. They're on the Voyager bridge as well. I mm. thought it might be in a holodeck, but yeah, museum is possible. Maybe they're at the Fleet Museum where Voyager is. Could be. And there's a microvirus that survived. It was one of those pause and scroll along kind of things, but it looks like there's a little dummy Tom Paris in the corner. Yeah, we have a reference to Move Along Home, a lot of people's least favourite episode of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> it is a horrific episode, yes. Yeah, so that. <laughs> but of all the people to put in it, Rutherford is a good choice. Yeah. Rom and Lita are witnessed in a single frame. Looks like we're on Ferengi and R, and Rom will be there with his wife, so that'll be cool. I think Ransom and Shax, they're wearing the same workout outfits that Crusher and Troy would wear in The Next Generation whenever they were stretching. I like to see that we've got Badgie back as well. Oh, yes. Return of Badgie. So that's quite cool to see. I wonder if they will get promoted or not. And they're teasing it in here. If nothing goes wrong, you'll get a promotion. Yeah. I'm wondering how likely it is that from the utterance of that sentence, everything goes wrong. Yeah, it looks good unless something goes wrong today and then something will go wrong that day. And then everything goes wrong. Promoting them at this point would make sense. And the fact that they're lieutenants doesn't mean that they're not lower decks anymore, I guess. Mm. Is there not a bit where Tendy says something like, being different ranks won't affect our friendship so maybe some of them will be promoted and not others there might be some of them are promoted or they're just talking about the potential of promotions if some of them get it and some of them don't remember when boimler was promoted and went aboard the titan and then when he got his transporter duplicate he was told you need to go back and be an ensign again yeah he got demoted again (laughs) it's not fair but then he got to meet captain pike which is referenced in this trailer as well yeah i like that there was a nod to that and they've just full-blown had it in the trailer and there's something strange attacking 
non-Federation and then Starfleet ships. And apparently the Cerritos is the best ship to investigate such things. Mm. Lots going on. I'm looking forward to it. It's coming on in September. So that'll be something to look forward to. A bit of Lower Decks, a bit of comedy Star Trek. I always find Lower Decks quite good fun. So yeah, looking forward to that. It has some serious beats in it, but it's also just tons of fun. It is. And the last video thing we got sight of on as part of Comic-Con is out this week, actually, as this drops. So you may have already seen it if you're listening later than the first couple of days of this podcast appearing. But we got a brief trailer for Subspace Rhapsody, which is the Strange New World's ninth episode. And it's Star Trek's first musical. (laughs) Something happens that means that the Enterprise crew can't help but burst into song. It features original songs written by the writer of the Josie and the Pussycats film, which is a very good film. So they're really taking this seriously. They're really wanting to make this the best thing it can be. And I am here for it. I like when Star Trek at least attempts to do different things. I'm not saying they'll all be successful. The Princess Bride episode, as we talked about, wasn't my favourite, but... At least it's variety, and then if it doesn't work for you, there'll be something else next week. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, that's the benefit of that episodic format that they're doing is if you don't like this, then there'll be something else. And they've done a couple of fun episodes this season doing the Lord X crossover, for example, and this one. Last season, they only really had the one that was primarily comedy episode, for want of a better description, whereas this, it seems that they've got two sets of that in there. But yeah, this is a really interesting one. I don't know if it is that they just happen to have a look around their cast and go, hey, some of these people can hold a tune. Or if they just decided, oh, what's Star Trek not done? A musical episode? Cool, let's get a musical episode out of the way. Usually if a show runs long enough, they'll let actors make use of some of their other talents when they're on stuff. Mm. So if they find out someone's a dancer or whatever, they can manufacture that in the plot. Normally it happens after a few years, whereas this is only season two. Yeah, a lot further in. But they definitely have musical talent. We know that Ahura can sing because she did so in the second episode of the show, actually. She unlocked the comet by singing to it and Spock joined her. So we know that Ethan Peck has some pipes. Christina Chong, she has released music as well. You can listen to her music. It's not my cup of tea, but she has that gift. Kirk's in this one. So maybe Paul Wesley can sing. I don't know if they ever did a musical episode of The Vampire Diaries. If not, they should have. But I was on for like a million years, so probably. (laughs) So I'm keen for it. I've seen some people complaining online that they think Strange New Worlds is doing too many gimmicky episodes, but it's the same people that complain about other Star Trek being too derivative of itself and too formulaic or too samey. So what do you want? You have a show that is delivering you something different every week. And you don't like the shows that aren't delivering you something different every week. So where's the line? What is it you actually want? Just don't watch the show if none of them are ever going to satisfy you. I wouldn't say it's done too many of them. Like you say, it's something a little bit different that you're not getting elsewhere. If you want deadpan serious the majority of the time, then watch Discovery or something like that. If Lower Decks is not your fancy, if a bit of humour and a bit of levity to it doesn't work, then that's fine. But things like this week's episode have been very, very serious episodes. They are doing some hard-hitting stuff in amongst there. That is episode eight for context. Yeah, it's time of recording. There are some pretty serious, really well-done episodes in amongst there as well. So I would say if the episode isn't for you, it isn't for you. But like you say, don't worry. There's a completely different one coming up next week. To some degree, I understand it because you only have 10 episodes in a season, Mm. whereas in Trek of Old, you'd be used to 26 episodes in a given season. So if they ever did a gimmicky episode somewhere within that, it was just one out of 26, whereas this is one out of 10. And this season, we've had the sitcom episode, we've had the crossover, we've had this. So that's three out of 10 are off-format fun episodes, quote-unquote, and... The rest of the season is just a mishmash of other stuff. But I don't really have an issue with it. I have issues with some of the problems that are created by the reduced episode count of Strange New Worlds in terms of what it wants you to follow. But if you want to hear me talk more about that, listen to our upcoming season podcast of season two, where I'll go into more detail about that. Or you can listen to We Are Starfleet, where I bring it up every time I'm on, I think. But the musical, I'm eager for it. I want to see how it pans out. 
Are you excited for it, or do you think this just might be a bridge too far? I see what you did there. I'm kind of all here for it. I think it's going to be a fun episode. I kind of enjoyed the episode in the previous season as well, as much as you hated it. I can enjoy just seeing the crew hanging out and doing things like this. I'm a bit curious as to how they're doing this, what the mechanism's going to be, or the reason for it is going to be. Do you think they will do a version of the firm Star Trek? <laughs> Now you've said that, I want to see that, but maybe not. Maybe they couldn't get the rights released. Maybe it's all original songs. Just even hearing the little a cappella Star Trek motif at the beginning <laughs> of this, I was like, yeah, I'm here for this. I wonder if the whole opening credits will be a cappella, like they did with uh, anime opening credits for the crossover episode. I wonder. Well, won't have long to wait till you find out. But that's happening. Or it may have already happened, depending on when you're listening to this, because the window is quite tight in terms of release and when the episode releases. More Star Trek stuff. This isn't based on a video, but they are celebrating 50 years of the animated series, the Star Trek animated series, that is, instead of just ignoring it like some people like to do. But they're going to celebrate it by doing some shorts in the aesthetic of the animated series featuring Quark, Riker... Saru gets in separate shorts. Jonathan Frakes, Armin Shimmerman and Doug Jones will all reprise their roles in these shorts that are coming out also in September, September 8th on Star Trek Day. Quite like this idea. No reason to doubt it will be a bit of fun and it might fill that hole that we've all been feeling when they just stopped making short treks a while ago. Yeah, it's interesting that they're doing this. I've never watched the animated series. Sorry. <laughs> I am one of those people who have ignored it. It's a tough one. That's the whole cast. Getting little shorts about these characters, I'm for that. I'm up for watching a little bit of that. What's to complain about in there? Nothing. Exactly. So I'm for that, getting Freaks back. I'm looking forward to a Quark short. I'm interested in what this is. When is it going to be set as well? Maybe it'll be him building his franchise. Potentially selling his Deep Space Nine models. The Riker drawing that they released as a promo is him in TNG era, so I presume it will be aboard the Enterprise. Quark is impossible to pin down. Saru is wearing his current uniform that you get in Discovery, so set either last season or this season, I suppose. That'll be fun. Just a fun little thing, and if you don't like it, it's a couple of minutes. Yeah. Cool. You're acknowledging and celebrating the animated series. That's something, I suppose. I know that Gene Roddenberry wanted to get it stricken from canon because he (laughs) didn't like it. (laughs) But Lower Decks has canonised some of it. You had the skeleton of the giant Spock in an episode and a couple of other things. They've brought some things back from the animated series that canonises the show. So there we go. Well done. That was it for Star Trek. That was a few things at Comic-Con. And, well, with Discovery, basically they'll run out of content. When that releases, unless the strike's resolved, then they can make more. They've also cancelled one of their flagship shows and one of their animated shows. So we only really have two shows at the moment after all this yeah because they've converted one into a movie haven't they section 31 yeah that's been converted and then one animated show gone it'll be interesting don't know if they're just testing the water with different things it'll be interesting to see what we hear about strange new worlds after this season and what the future holds for that at the moment i'm hoping it gets renewed well season three is a definite lot oh is that definite and excellent when they renewed it for season two they also renewed it for season three okay So I don't need to fear then. Nothing to fear. Well, Prodigy tells us that they can just bin it anyway, whether they promise to make it or not. So nothing is certain, is what I'm saying. Sleep in fear. (laughs) Move on to a couple other things. One thing that came out of Comic-Con, DC is making two more animated films. One is a Watchmen animated movie, and the other they're doing Crisis on Infinite Earths, but an animated one. Watchmen, it's unclear if that's going to be an adaptation of the comic or some kind of side or sequel or something don't know they already did a Watchmen movie in live action and i thought it was really good so do we need an animated one probably not but could be good both have potential both sound interesting whether i will end up watching them initially or not i miss a lot of the dc animated content i know you're a lot more over it than i am Mostly because I end up getting to talk to some people involved in it for 10 minutes at a time whenever they're bringing something out. The Crisis one will be interesting. I don't know if they're going to follow the comic or whether they'll do a Crisis on Infinite Earths based on the various animated movies because they've done a bunch of universes through them in terms of various continuities. So they could merge some of those, Batman, Ninja and whatever else that they've already done. 
obviously nothing with Kevin Conroy. That would be interesting if they tie up some of the existing animated stuff. That would be quite cool. We'll see. Uh, it's something. And it might be a way of them tying up all their disparate universes that they've done across the animated stuff. But I was never really worried about the various continuities that existed across the animated movies because I just saw each one as a kind of standalone thing that was in its own bubble. And there's some of them that are sequels to some of them and some of them that are standalone things. Yeah, I was all right with it. I didn't really need continuity tidying up in that way because that's what Crisis on Infinite Earths was originally conceived to do. We have too much continuity and we need to tidy it up. We need one continuity. And then eventually they brought back the multiverse and created the same mess for themselves and had to do another one and so on. (laughs) And they're still at it. Every now and again, comics just gets too large and they have to destroy it all and start again. And then they immediately get too large and have to destroy it all and start again. Maybe they're doing something similar with their animated stuff. I don't know. But they're making a Crisis on Infinite Earths thing. Interesting. Yeah. We had another final trailer as well for Gen V, the boys' spin-off. I'm not sure about this. It looks really, really grim. And the thing I was worried about with the spin-off is the boys always teeters on the edge of being inaccessible for me because of the fact that everybody in it is essentially just a horrible person. The Mm. thing that keeps me connected is they have a couple of characters that are redeemable. So Annie or Starlight, for example, and... Mother's Milk, those kinds of characters, there's some good in them. Whereas other ones, they're pretty awful. Even Butcher is just a terrible person. He's just slightly less terrible than Homelander, or he's aiming his terribleness in another direction. But this looks like it's just going to be wall-to-wall unpleasantness based on this trailer, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be able to stomach that over the course of a season. The last season, I didn't enjoy as much as the first couple the last season was disgusting in places. Yeah, the last season was disgusting. And a lot of the time it just didn't make sense apart from just trying to outdo stuff that they've done previously. Like each season they've got to build on what they've done and make it even more, even more, even more. And I spent a lot of it going, but why? Was there a reason that you had to do it this way? Apart from just, we want to do more. We want to be more gross. We want more people talking about it for being more gross. And for me, it was not as enjoyable. And like you say even some redeemable characters, inverted commas, have strayed from the path slightly as well, which then you go, okay, I'm not quite sure who I'm rooting for in this case. I just think you're all awful. I'm waiting for an asteroid to hit the planet at this point. Gen V, the trailer, starts out looking a little bit different and a little bit interesting like if you did your x-men style thing of oh well it's a place of learning and you can all be yourselves do not fear da 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 all that and then very quickly the latter half of the trailer is more no it's all grim and disgusting again so i don't know how long the happy-go-lucky image lasts before it all bursts i'm gonna guess episode one half an episode yeah (laughs) episode one and it all goes wrong but there might be some redeeming qualities in it like you say if you got characters who are as disgusted with the situation as you are potentially it works and there might be some redeeming qualities in there i will start it whether i finish it or not is a different bet yeah i'll give it a go but i feel like it might just be a bit too much for me i mean one of the characters powers is based on them cutting themselves which when you're doing a show that's about teenagers i guess they'd be college age rather than high school age even still, the self-harm thing is very much a college problem as well. Mm. It strikes me as it's going to try and be edgy for the sake of being edgy, and I don't like when things do that. There's something really juvenile about it. Yeah, I guess so. But that's been a problem, like I said, with the previous season of the main show. So the fact that that's going to drip over into this tracks. I don't know if it's that they think they get more people talking about it by going, oh, you won't believe how gross the last episode was. How bad was that? How terrible was this scene sort of thing? And that's just feeding it. It means, oh, people are talking about us if we do this. What if superheroes were disgusting is what the boy seems to be asking lately. Yes, I guess. The first season, there was elements of it that were quite for me, but it was sort of, what if superheroes were bad? Did not maybe have the same morals that we would apply? And... In order to emphasise that, you had dark moments and some disgusting moments. I'm trying to think of a better word than disgusting, but let's go with disgusting. Let's keep going. Let's hit the disgusting button more often. In that early season, the next, it's then just built up, built up, built up, built up. Whereas this, 
you would hope would be starting from a different sort of baseline, but we'll see. It's also in September. September's going to be a busy month for stuff. So much in September. Yeah, although my schedule will be cleared up when I watch the first episode of Gen V and then think, nah, I'm out, that's it, that's enough. <laughs> I thought you would need something to fill your CW gap. You've got almost a CW set up at the beginning there. It's pretty far from the CW. The CW had a line that it couldn't cross. I'm talking about the beginning of the trailer, Craig, not the end of the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the illusion of the CW comfort would be shattered very quickly. (laughs) Ah, yes, looks good. They're going to college. There's the suggestion of a love triangle. And she's now cutting herself and using the blood as a whip or whatever she's doing. That escalates quickly. I wonder how sustainable the boy's concept is, though, because it seems like Homelander is getting to the point where he needs to be stopped because... How far is he going to go? He was kind of embracing it towards the end of the last season, so dark times ahead for that universe. Yeah, definitely. I think that's us. I can beam you back to wherever you were before you smash into that window. Or if you'd rather smash into the window, I can also make that happen. Oh, do I get to smash out the window? Well, you would mostly just be like a smear on the view screen. Oh, that's fine. That works for me. Put me out my misery and tell Isaac I said hi. I may have done that, I can't remember. Time travel and stuff. Now I need to find a squelch sound effect instead of the transporter sound effect. Anything to give you extra work, mate. Yeah, extra work. (laughs) You deserve to smear across a view screen. And he's gone. I think he might have said hello. I don't know. I don't know. Well, ten toy screwdrivers are on the way. That's good. Two for everybody. Great. Can't wait to put that in a drawer and never look at it again. I'll play with it once. I'll maybe use it to annoy the cat. That'll be fun. He'll break it. They should bring out a sonic screwdriver laser pointer, because then I can use it on the can. Should bring out a screwdriver shaped like the sonic screwdriver. <laughs> you know those electric ones when you put up shelves and it just yeah, spins? Yeah, yeah. You're catering to people who do have to put shelves up to put all our books and dolls and Funko Pops and stuff. All our rip-off memorabilia. All off memorabilia. But if you sold an actual screwdriver which had just a handle, I'd buy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has a use could justify this. It's a bit like that spatula I've got that's a Star Wars one and the handle is Luke's lightsaber but it's really uncomfortable to hold. Or the Star Trek pizza cutter. Yeah, it doesn't work either. (laughs) No, it doesn't work either, but it looks cool. It's a thing you're like, oh, I'll buy that. I'll buy a Star Trek pizza cutter. I don't care if it doesn't actually cut the pizza. Just drags the cheese off. (laughs) And it's really awkward to hold. Yeah. Just rubbish. Well, no, we didn't think you would actually use this. Yeah. We thought you would just leave it in a box. Leave it in a box and forget about it. Insane. Very anyway, let's move on to some non-trailer news stuff. We have a couple of bits about Deadpool 3. One of is a picture of Deadpool and Wolverine in a desert or something. Yeah, with a giant burnt down 20th Century Fox monolith. Yeah, and the striking thing is Hugh Jackman is wearing the classic yellow Wolverine costume and the Deadpool costume's changed a little bit as well. Yeah, it's a bit brighter. Yeah, the Wolverine costume, I'm not crazy about it, to be honest. It looks a bit over-designed. And if you know the character of Wolverine from the films, he would never wear this. Because obviously, yeah, if you like the cartoons or the classic Wolverine, then that's his look. But this cinema Wolverine that we know, the Hugh Jackman one, just wears like a vest or a jacket. Or the weird leather Matrixy X Men uniforms. Yeah, but when he's not with the X Men, he's just sort of wearing whatever because he's just a guy. So it does look a bit odd seeing him in this big thing. I do know a lot of people are upset about the sleeves, but that's for Hugh Jackman's own personal health, so that's fine. <laughs> But there was that picture of how ripped he was getting for it as well. Yeah, he's not phoning it in. It's like, if I'm coming back as Wolverine, I'm going to go all in. <laughs> there were some pictures of him doing the claws and presumably cutting people in half and whatever he'll be up to. There's been a suggestion that the costume is just something that Deadpool forces him to wear for some reason. Probably, yeah. So the point is that it's supposed to look stupid. Yeah, that's likely. Because the problem with Deadpool movies is they're not formulaic and everything we see could be a joke. So it's like, this might not even be in the movie. I'm pretty sure it'll be in the film, but I don't think it'll be, no, he's seriously wearing this. Yeah, he's not wearing this the whole time. It's just like, for this thing, I've set your costume and you have to wear this. Yeah, we'll see. As much as it's preying on nostalgia, I can't deny that I really want to see Hugh Jackman as Wolverine again. Yeah, no, it's definitely fun. And especially because also, if it's the movie, the reason Spider-Man did it better than Doctor Strange, for example, in my opinion, is in Doctor Strange, it was just for a scene, for a room. Whereas this is like, no, this is what the movie is. It's going to happen for a few hours and you get your money's worth seeing him back again. On that subject, actually, people are worried that Deadpool 3 is going to become what people were worried Spider-Man No Way Home was going to end up being. 
because there's all sorts of rumours of cameos and things like that. I'm going to manage my expectations on that because I don't believe that they're going to make that mistake again. But the other bit of news that's confirmed, there's so many rumours and I'm not going to get into any of them really, but one that's definitely happening is that Jennifer Garner's Electra is returning. So the rumour is that it's Deadpool saying goodbye to the Fox universe in some way. Some have suggested it might be Deadpool kills the Fox universe. Yeah, because there's a comic Deadpool kills the Marvel, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it will be he kills the Fox universe, but I think it will be him leaving it in some way and doing some kind of victory tour or something. Or these are all the people he wants to come with him. I'm ditching this dying thing to go to MCU and other people are like, no, I want to come too and I want to be. There's some on set stills where he's fighting TVA agents from Loki. Yeah, so they'll be playing with dimensional stuff. The Electra announcement reminds me of the Jamie Foxx announcement, as in when that came out, everyone was like, really? Oh yeah, Jamie Foxx's Electro back. Yeah. Who asked for this? Me. But I like Amazing Spider-Man too. <laughs> But who's asking for Jennifer Garner's Electra? No one. Starring in the Daredevil film that very few people like and starring in the Electra film that absolutely nobody likes. Okay, we're not talking cameos, but if you could do a wish thing of, is there one Fox one you'd like to see? I think Ian McKellen's Magneto would be great to see again. I'm not putting Patrick Stewart on the list because I've already had that. I feel like the best exit for him was Logan and the Doctor Strange one I'd like to just kind of ignore. Yeah, because it wasn't enough to be meaningful in the movie it just kind of happened i would like the fantastic four though not the josh trank team the other one the chris evans one yeah that'd be a good one i think just so he gets it done i'd really like for channing tatum to have the gambit go just to be gambit yeah. get to be gambit you finally got to be gambit you can do it once we've already paid you anyway to do it you might as well plus it's sean levy directing this and channing tatum had a small role in free guy as well yeah that's true could happen could happen, could see Gambit. The thing is, though, in terms of the Fox superhero universe, the only choices you really have are the Fantastic Four, any of the X-Men characters, and Daredevil. Yeah. The Fantastic Four, I didn't mind those films, so I wouldn't mind seeing them in some capacity. X-Men characters, I don't know. Most of them are take or leave it, aren't they? Yeah. Outside of some of them. We've already seen Patrick Stewart's Professor X come back, and I don't want to see that again. So Magneto, Ian McKellen's Magneto. That'd be fun. Nobody else. Really? They never really committed to much, did they? No. When Tobey Maguire came back, everyone was like, oh, it's incredible. Like, I love this Spider-Man. And with all these, it's like, Elliot Page was Kitty Pride and <laughs> Frasier's back as Oh, yeah, his beast. His beast. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. But a lot actually. of them, it would take a minute. You're like, oh, yeah, Nightcrawler was in one. Oh, yeah, it's that frog <laughs> or whatever. The thing is, though, we already kind of had that with Days of Future Past anyway. Yeah, they sort of had fun with that already. Yeah, so I think they should keep it contained a bit, but it's good that we're getting all the Deadpool-specific characters, Colossus and Vanessa and so on. Yeah, and they'll probably have fun with different Deadpools. The X-Men Origins Wolverine one would probably show up again if it's TVA stuff. Yeah, because they haven't ran that into the ground in two Deadpool films. Deadpool, it's an unpredictable, well, it's its own franchise, kind of. It's within things, but it kind of has fun, and the point of it is to have fun. So this one, they could get away with stuff more, I think, because it's all very lighthearted anyway. Yeah, but Jennifer Garner's an interesting choice. I'm not going to say it's a good choice, but it's an interesting choice. An interesting choice. I wouldn't be surprised if Ben Affleck's Daredevil turns up as well. We'll see. He's sick of being deleted from DC films after doing the work, so he's here now. It's a good joke to bring back Ben Affleck's Daredevil. I'm like, it's Batman. It's like, no, I wasn't Batman this time. What did he do? I had echolocation, like a bat. No, <laughs> that was a different one. And they could do the silhouette where you see the horns and everybody thinks it's the bat ears. The joke writes itself, doesn't it? So speaking of Batman and by context his good friend superman <laughs> yeah that's it for marvel so we can hop over the fence to dc the production or the pre-production for superman legacy is going quite quickly actually oh it's slow down now but we have our superman and we have our lois lane yeah david cornswit has been cast to play superman and rachel brosnahan is on board to play lois lane i don't know much about these two i'm just going from yep yeah, that looks like a superman could do both the big well, I say both, all three. He could do all three of the big farmhand friendly small town Smallville guy. He could do the journalist Clark Kent guy, and he could be Superman. Did you see the video that was doing the rounds of him just having Clark Kent energy in a scene that he was in and something? Oh, yeah, it was just in some office thing. Yeah, he looked like Clark Kent. He had the glasses and the suit and stuff, and he was acting a bit Clark Kent esque. Yeah, so I've not seen him in anything other than clips, but excellent. Well, he's been in relatively little, which is on brand for Superman casting, really. 
Yeah, exactly. You just get just get someone. Just someone. People were complaining he's not ripped enough, and a he'll bulk up probably, yeah. and b he's Superman. He doesn't need to be super ripped. I saw a thing ages ago. Probably able to find it now. It was Brian Cranston gets annoyed because everyone keeps talking to him about being Lex Luthor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm the boringest option. If he did it, I'd bring nothing new. You know what my Lex Luthor would be like. Stop asking me about Lex Luthor. It would essentially be Heisenberg again. Yes, I could just be doing that again. <laughs> and it was based on the fact that well, he's played a bald guy. Anybody can play a bald guy. Yeah, he's like, you're just picking me because I'm bald and I've been a villain in a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can shave their head. Or you could have Lex Luthor that has hair. That's not impossible. You already did that. The most surprisingly good one was that guy from Two and a Half Men. <laughs> and you're like, how's he Lex Luthor? And you watch him and like, oh yeah, it's pretty good. John Cryer. Yeah, he was good. You've got the one in Superman and Lois as well. He's all right. I watch Superman and Lois. I don't know why. He's brutal, though. He's very unhinged and brutal. Yeah. It's actually Alex you haven't seen an awful lot of. It was quite funny. I can't remember the guy's name for the life of me, but when people are wondering who the next Lex Luthor is, and he tweeted, I'm the next Lex Luthor. You're wondering about the next, next Lex Luthor. Yeah. But it's also, can we just have a Superman story that doesn't have Lex Luthor in it? Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Everything we've heard about Superman Legacy sounds promising, how it's more Clark Kenty and more workplace and stuff. Well, they said parts of it were going to be a workplace comedy, didn't it? Yeah. Or a workplace drama or something. In Superman, Lex Luthor, just in general, due to the nature of him in Metropolis, he's always in the news or present. But he doesn't necessarily have to be a Lex Luthor plot in a Superman movie. It's like in the Christopher Reeve ones. Lex Luthor's always, because he is the self-made man of Metropolis or whatever, and he's a giant part of that universe. He could be in the story of the movie, but not the villain. <laughs> Lex Corp have done this, or he's running for mayor, or whatever he's up to. It doesn't have to be the movie. Yeah, maybe do one of the other Superman villains. Yeah, I th- I'm not in a rush to see a Lex Luthor plot, but I think it'd be odd if they just didn't mention him, or if, if he wasn't part of this world. In terms of David Corrin's way, it was annoying me when people were saying, he doesn't look ripped enough or whatever. Superman doesn't need to be ripped, he's powerful. He doesn't need to have rippling muscles. He's not strong because he's bulked up. It's from a different planet. <laughs> Christopher Reeve wasn't. He was fit. Just a guy. Henry Cavill. When you look at him as Superman, you're like, oh, that guy's huge. And then you look at him as Clark Kent and it's like, you're not fooling anyone. Yeah, like this Clark Kent's massive. We shouldn't be talking about hopes of this movie, but I kind of hope this is more of a Christopher Reeve style costume as well. I'm invincible. <laughs> I'm just wear blue and a cloak and some boots. Bring back the trunks. We're not here to discuss trunks. We're here to discuss casting. In terms of Rachel Brosnan, she's the most experienced of the two of them. She's been in things like House of Cards, Fabulous Mrs. Maisel and all that stuff. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, sorry, not Fabulous. That's a different show, probably. So she's done that. But again, that's good because the early Lois and Clark dynamic is she's the experienced one and he isn't. Yeah. I like that. I like the two of them. They both have a good look for it and all that. So I'm pleased with his casting. I think it's going to be good. I'm really rooting for this film. Yeah, same. The thing I'm worried about with it, though, is even if it's good, it might just be coming too soon. People might not care by then. Yeah, and too soon could also be like too late. By the time this rolls around, these movies aren't making much. See, Flash didn't make much money. Blue Beetle's going to be a loss. Aquaman 2 is going to tank. Marvel's will at best do okay, probably. But I don't think it'll make the billion that Captain Marvel 1 made. It wouldn't make its money back, yeah. It'll do fine depending on how much stuff comes out in November as well. People always say the superhero bubble's bursting. I don't think it's bursting, but I think it's definitely deflating a whole lot. I think it's just the mediocrity bubble's bursting. Yeah, because there's been so much of it. There is also still very good ones, but a lot of people are like, everything's superheroes now. A lot of people are not turning up. It was Phil Lord, maybe, when he was talking about Spider-Verse, he says the fatigue isn't superhero fatigue, it's that I've seen this film a dozen times fatigue. Yeah. I've been calling it mediocrity fatigue. As in, you go and see these things and they're fine, but was it worth my time, really? We've just seen this one. This isn't a new one. Yeah, it's the same movie as we just had. But yeah, as a Superman fan, this looks like the best chance to get a really good modern Superman movie. It'll be really annoying if it ends up being really good, but people just don't care and don't go and see it because it's just not been long enough. Also, personally, I never find James Gunn movies to be that funny. <laughs> Oh, no, me neither. I very rarely laugh at them. Yeah, so I know when he says workplace comedy stuff, I hope it's not too much of James Gunn. It's got that sort of stand-up effect where it's like a character will do a bit of a stand-up routine and stuff, and you're like, okay. It kind of sounds like he wants to bring back some of the energy from the Christopher Reeve, Margot Kidder movies. I was about to say Margot Robbie there. That'd be a different film. Christopher Reeve and Margot Robbie. Well, judging by what The Flash did, that's not impossible. That's the scary part. I was going to say The Flash 2, but that'd be a Flash 2. 
Yeah, there's no chance. But the idea of the kind of workplace hijink stuff that they were doing in those films a little bit, playing around with that, as in Clark's this bumbling new reporter and Lois just walks all over him sort of thing, that dynamic, I feel like they'll try and bring that back to some degree. That's right, tangent-wise, but I did see a good joke on Twitter recently. The Flash 2 will be about Barry Allen going back in time to stop the Flash 1. Really. <laughs> try to stop that from happening breaks the universe again and now batman is i don't know oh did you see the thing about andy machete said the reason michael keaton's batman retired because a criminal watched him kill a child (laughs) or something (laughs) where's that from the movie's already doing bad it's not in the movie this movie can take a negative publicity hit by saying that this batman killed a kid or something it's not in the film and in the film it says that gotham's one of the safest places in this country now so he retired because he won he retired because he's 80. <laughs> Not because he killed a kid. Well, he retired because his work was done. He accomplished what he said. I do. guess it's like the Kingdom Come Batman, where he's like, yeah, it's fine now. I can just sort of monitor this. It's fine. I can sit in my basement and make spaghetti. But we have more Superman legacy casting. Actually, the casting of Superman and Lois happened the day after the recording of the last news podcast. So thanks, James Gunn, for making us wait a month to talk about it. The last time you did DC stuff, you did it on the day we recorded. That was much nicer of you. So do better, James Gunn, thanks. But anyway, we got more casting after this. This was one that you sent me and I was like, I haven't even heard this yet. But it was pretty hot off the press at that point. This could be slightly concerning. We have three characters cast. Isabella Merced will play Hawk Girl, Eddie Gathege will be Mr. Terrific, and Nathan Fillion will play Green Lantern, but not the Green Lantern that everybody wants him to play. Playing the worst one, but also <laughs> that's the one that everybody wants him to play. Apparently they'd cast him because he wants to give Nathan Fillion a big bowl cut. I think Nathan Fillion will be up for it. Yeah, people are saying this is a lot, but these characters, they tend to be, as far as I'm aware, these are ensemble people. Mr. Terrific, he tends to be, not in the service, but he tends to be a go-to for the Justice League or whatever as an Intel guy. This Green Lantern, he may not be invested, these are just the space police. You might just be on the case of something, like say if the movie stars Lobo or someone, and then it's like, oh yeah, we've been tracking this guy or whatever. Hawk woman, I don't know much about. Hawk girl. A hawk girl. It depends what version they go with. Sometimes she's an alien, sometimes she's a reincarnated Egyptian priestess. She could be more of the second superhero, because this is a relatively early Superman. Yeah, it's weird that he's in a universe that already has existing heroes in it. That's a bit Smallville vibes as well. Yeah, so that could be there to be, this is an experience one. This is where you need to get to be and stuff. But it's not like a Batman and Wonder Woman situation where this is the core three or whatever. Yeah, if they do her as the alien, that'll be interesting because he's an alien and they can do a connection in that way. And the Green Lantern that they're going with. Nathan Fillion's Guy Gardner, he's a space cop. And then Mr. Terrific will just be a genius. Yeah, they all could be filling in roles that Superman usually isn't. Like, he's not really that smart of a guy and never really needs to be a fighter as a farmhand and stuff. So these could be just different mentor characters that help him on his journey. Wasn't there people accused James Gunn of, uh, so you're already planning your spin-offs and stuff, and he said that he's never put a character in anything that he plans to do a spin-off with. He always says that he puts his characters in because they serve that story, but then Peacemaker happened, so I don't quite believe him. Well, that's true, yeah, I forgot about Peacemaker. His Guardians movies, none of the characters there were designed to spin off into anything. Yeah, but also because we've had the world of who is this Batman or who is this Superman and stuff. We've already seen a lot of movies where it's like the world gets used to the first superhero and whatever. So if you are doing a rebrand, people are used to this idea already. And now it's like, oh, yeah, this is just another meta human in this world that has many of them. Yeah, could be. Mare said she was Dora in the live action Dora movie. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. It was pretty good, actually. Quite enjoyed it. The Mr. Terrific actor, he was in the Twilight movies. He's also Darwin from X-Men First Class. Oh, yeah. As in the character that can't die, who's the only one who dies. And Nathan Fillion is, of course... Nathan Fillion in everything he is in, yeah. And the guy you always confuse with, Brendan Fraser. Oh, that other guy, I can't remember, yeah. (laughs) I forgot about that. Brendan Fraser, who was supposed to be in Batgirl. Well, he was in Batgirl, we'll just never see it. He was supposed to be Firefly, but... Nathan Fillion was in a show called Fire. You can see why I'm getting confused. <laughs> it all links up. They're all the same. It's like my Ben Mendelsohn, Mads Mikkelsen mix up. Yeah. Your Ben Mendelsohn, Mads Mikkelsen is my Nathan Fillion, other guy, Brendan Fraser. <laughs> There's no logical reason why we keep making that mistake. It just keeps happening. Everyone has to have two sets of celebrities that don't look alike or haven't starred together in much, but you can never get them right. 
<laughs> so that's something that's happening that could be interesting i wonder which version of hawk girl it will be i have to put the emphasis there because otherwise it sounds like i'm trying to say hot girl which hot girl is going to be in this one <laughs> well isabella merced of course yeah it's a hollywood movie if it's the alien then that brings the thanagarians into it the hawk people or if she's a reincarnated priestess then you have to explain why the hawk thing and where's Hawkman as well well they get the one that was in black adam i get the one that was in black adam because james gunn's keen to bring stuff in from the rock dc universe isn't they the rock of this, yeah. We have a last bit for Superman Legacy. Anthony Carrigan is going to be playing Metamorpho. Anthony Carrigan's a strange looking bald guy who's been in a lot of comic book stuff. He has alopecia, doesn't he? Yeah. I don't mean to like body shame him or whatever, but I think he said I'm just a weird looking bald guy and that's why I get cast in these things. He was saying what he liked about being Metamorpho. Usually, the characters I have to play are the villains or they're designed to be creepy, but it's nice to be one of the hero characters. <laughs> He was in Gotham. He was Victor Zaz in the Gotham TV show. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I was thinking the Nolan one. And then the Flash, the TV show that is, he was some guy who could turn into poison gas. So he seemed quite happy. He was like, get to be a goodie. Not every bold character in a Superman story is a villain. <laughs> the quote was, I like comic books, but I did when all my hair fell out, go through the kind of pantheon of all these bald superheroes and supervillains and made note of them, Kerrigan said. I remember seeing Metamorpho. I think he had like a giant like hammer for a hand. And I was like, that guy's badass. Noted. We'll store that one away. He says like a lot in this quote. It seems like he was blindsided by the question. Yeah, it's like stumbling around. <laughs> Playing this character is meaningful as a member of the alopecia community. This character is from what I've learned of the source material. He didn't like the way he looked. And I can really relate to that. The actor added... You know, when he got his powers, he thought it was a curse. That's something I really felt for a while. In my case, I turned it around and saw it as a blessing. So I'm excited to bring that to the table with this character. Yeah, that's good. Good for him. Yeah. And James Gunn has previous for just plucking relatively unknown TV actors and doing stuff with them. Yeah. Superman Legacy. I'm looking forward to it. Please be good. Yeah. Let's give us a good Superman movie. Anyway, let's move on to some miscellaneous stuff. We haven't got that much, actually. We're nearly there. Yellow Jacket star Sarah Desjardins boards Tron Ares. And the reason I chose this article is because it also explains the other one that's happening. Speaking of Gotham, Cameron Monaghan is also joining that film. He was the Joker, kind of, but also not, and definitely was, in Gotham. And he is Cal Kestis in the Star Wars video games. Yeah. Also in this film are Evan Peters, Jodie Turner-Smith, Greta Lee and Jared Leto. Great. The film's about Leto's computer program Ares on a journey from the digital world to that of humans. That's all it says about it. She was in Yellow Jackets, a TV show I haven't seen, and I've seen Cameron Monaghan in Gotham and Star Wars. Yeah. Next up, we had some Paul King stuff earlier with Wonka. We have some news about Paddington in Peru, a film that he is not making, but it's been announced that Olivia Coleman, Antonio Banderas, Rachel Zegler, and Emily Mortimer are to join that film. Some good names in there. Of course, Olivia Coleman's always a big draw. I really like Rachel Zegler. She hasn't been in much, but she was good in West Side Story, even though I didn't really like it. And she was really good in Shazam as well. Okay, yeah, I've not seen the... I've never got names to faces. It's the film where the internet was attacking Rachel Zegler because she admitted that she did Shazam because she needed the work. I mean, that's fair. Why are you in this film? Well, because they cast me and I wanted the job. Yeah. There was a thing recently in Chris Ruckerson interview where it's like, what was one of the things that got you to take on the role of Doctor Who with a reboot? It's like, I was divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. It's the same reason you go to your office. Because I need to pay for stuff. Yeah. I always hate this. Especially with comic book stuff, they really want the actors to have a profound personal connection to the material. Yeah, it's that weird age where like, they did the publicity shots where like, Brie Larson would be reading the Captain Marvel or Benedict Cumberbatch would be reading Doctor Strange on his downtime and stuff. No, he isn't. <laughs> we don't have to pretend it's fine. Yeah, we understand it's acting. Plus, Rachel Zegler, how committed is she going to be to a fairly nothing, thankless role in a comic book movie? I mean, yeah, if you were the lead and you put effort in, it's like, oh yeah, just one of the characters in it. It's like, okay, whatever. I'm forgotten in a redraft of the script almost. It's not a big deal. But anyway, she's going to be one of the people that's in Paddington in Peru. Olivia Coleman will play the Reverend Mother, described as a blithe and sunny guitar-playing nun who runs a home for retired bears. I love this already. Yep. Banderas plays Hunter Cabot, a dashing and intrepid riverboat captain who offers to help the Brown family in their Peruvian adventure. The same character in 
Indiana Jones. <laughs> Pretty much. His daughter, Gina Cabot, will be played by Rachel Zegler. Antonia Banderas is kind of too old to have a Rachel Zegler aged daughter. Fire aligned. But it just says his daughter. She doesn't even get any characteristics. Yeah. Her father is dashing and intrepid and she's his daughter. Mortimer joins the Brown family as Mrs. Brown, re- replacing Sally Hawkins. Mm, that's weird. wonder if that would be like in The Mummy, where Maria Bello is suddenly the Evie character in the third film. They'll gloss over it. Story will follow Paddington as he returns to Peru to visit his beloved Aunt Lucy, who now resides at the home for retired bears. With the Brown family in tow, a thrilling adventure ensues when a mystery plunges them into an unexpected journey through the Amazon rainforest and up to the mountain peaks of Peru. Didn't they get Aunt Lucy to visit him in London at the end of the last film? Yeah, it was. It was Aunt Lucy, yeah. You can see your family more than once, I guess. They can come visit you and you can go visit them. I'm guessing the home for retired bears will be some kind of cutthroat place that she shouldn't be. Olivia Colman's clearly the villain. <laughs> because as much as a guitar playing nun doesn't sound like one. It's like, yeah, no, she's a villain. It's like in Happy Gilmore when his grand goes to the retirement home and she's making license plates or whatever. I don't really like that film, but I just remember that. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be more of a World War Two style prison of war escape movie, but with a load of retired bears digging tunnels and sneaking around. It's weird they're replacing Sally Hawkins, though. It happens. Dougal Wilson is directing, not Paul King, so I don't know if this is going to take a turn where it's not great because of that reason i'm not sure well i think they know what works know how to make it charming so they can just sort of carry on that same vibe and it should be okay i mean the first two films were great so i'm hoping that this one will be at least half as great yeah okay let's move on samara weaving is set to star in the 20th century heist thriller eeny meeny which Sean Simmons is directing. Simmons also penned the script with Rhett Rees and Paul Wernick producing. The film follows a former teenage getaway driver who is dragged back into her unsavoury past when a former employer offers her a chance to save the life of her chronically unreliable ex-boyfriend. Sounds pretty decent. I like Samara Weaving. I don't know if you've seen anything she's been in. What has she been in? She was in the horror Ready or Not, where she plays a game of deadly hide-and-seek in a wedding dress. Why are you telling me about that? She's apparently just wrapped production on Little Sky, which is Netflix's first comedy pilot, where she plays the lead. She was in Scream 6, but only in the opening scene. Okay. She's also in Snake Eyes. Yeah, I've not seen any of it. Six. <laughs> okay, so you've not seen Samara Weaving in it? Yeah, I've not seen Samara Weaving. She'll be next in the comedic thriller Borderline, as well as the action horror film Azrael. It sounds like a reasonable premise. It's a Hulu thing. Yeah. I like Samara Weaving. She's a good lead for these sorts of things. Yeah. Move on. Greta Gerwig, who is rocketed to success with Barbie, of course. Yeah. She's attached to direct a couple of Narnia movies for Netflix. Yeah, that's fun. I'm assuming they aren't continuing with the Narnia series when they announce like a seven movie. No, I think this will be going back to the start and just adapting it from scratch again. Yeah. So it won't follow on from the ones that had Liam Neeson in them. I saw a really... One popular Guardian article of the day about people going like, oh, Greta Gerwig selling out and going for the Uh, big movies. (laughs) That's normal. You make a little movie and then you do well and now you can make bigger movies. I always kind of like that when these indie darlings get snapped up to do bigger projects because I really like how annoyed people get. They get so annoyed and it's like, oh, selling out. People people don't want to make movie set in a van forever you can do stuff that's fine but then you can also want to do other things also she already sold out she made a barbie movie and also no one's asked it's like oh yeah they're selling out did you ask them what they want maybe they've <laughs> i want to make a big movie but it's kind of like ah oh, indie darling george lucas after his was it graffiti <laughs> success like, graffiti, like, no he's yeah. gonna make some dumb big movie or whatever <laughs> Such a boring reaction. And this is the person that has just made a Barbie movie for a big studio that's based on a toy. Yeah. I really liked her. I think I've seen... She did two with Noah Baumbach, didn't she? Directing, and then she's done Little Women and Lady Bird. And now Barbie, so yeah. I haven't seen Little Women. I didn't like Lady Bird that much. I like them both. I thought they were really good. Little Women's very good. I've not seen Barbie, but I heard high things. So yeah, I think good that good directors get to make more things. I think the last thing that people got annoyed at before this was Paul Mescal appearing in Gladiator and stuff. Oh, he's sold out. He's off to do the franchise crap now. Yep, good for him. Cool, fine. Can't wait till he gets cast as a human torp for a seven-picture deal and everybody loses their mind. Tell the people who just make the assumption, oh, this person's been in a small movie, so why would they want to do a different thing? Because they might want to. If you didn't ask them, they might want to do anything. It's always exciting to do a different role. You know what? I want to make a film with big actors with a budget. That sounds great. Yeah. Fantastic. Just have a big play about in a green screen. It could be fun. <laughs> just let them have fun. 
No official announcement has been made, but it's long been rumoured that Gerwig, who worked with the streamer on the Noah Baumbach directed White Noise, which I haven't seen, would tackle a Narnia movie. She's made a deal to direct two films in the C.S. Lewis Narnia franchise. In 2018, Netflix announced they'd acquired the film and TV rights to the Chronicles of Narnia book series. I don't know if this is just me, though, but I think the problem with the Narnia series is most people have read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and nothing else. That's why it's probably best to go on a tape. Do the one everyone knows, then maybe another one. I think they had to change a lot about the other two that they made to fit more directly into The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, because I don't think the books are as strictly connected. Yeah, I don't know much about the books, but I do know that, like when we talk about June earlier, there's like a million June books, but people don't know any beyond the first one. I've read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and I think I've read Prince Caspian, but I don't remember it, and I don't think I was engaged by it. But The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, it's the one, isn't it? It's the story that everybody will know. Yeah. Jesus and religion and all that stuff is what it's all about. Yeah, that's good for her. They should get more stuff. Yeah. Her directorial breakout was Lady Bird, which netted five Oscar nominations. She did Little Women. Frances Ha as well was another one. Frances Ha. And there was Miss America or something like that that she did with No Bomber. I'll look it up. She's an actor as well, isn't she? Greta Gerwig. Yeah, she, Frances Ha. She did the screenplay. She plays Frances and... No Baumbach directed that one. Oh yeah, she's done quite a lot of actress stuff. She's a voice in Isle of Dogs. She's in Jackie. Yeah, she's married to Noah Baumbach, I think. So I think she tends to show up in Mistress America, as you know what I was thinking of. That's quite good. She's Maggie in Maggie's Plan. I've seen that. Oh yeah, she did the not picked up pilot for How I Met Your Dad. She was the lead in that. The first time they tried to do a How I Met Your Mother, but from the woman's perspective. A How I Met Your Father version, yeah. And now there's that awful show starring Hilary Duff that actually made it. I've seen the How I Met Your Dad pilot, it's not that good. But good for her. And I quite like the indie snobs are getting pissed off about it as well. Yeah, That's I always good. like when indie snobs get pissed off by stuff. I can't wait till she does all these interviews where she, the reason I became a filmmaker was after reading the Narnia books and I wanted to do them. Like, now I'm doing them. Those interviews will start coming out, won't they? Yeah, there'll be some of that. On a similar theme... So we had the, for me, pretty tired discourse around Barbie and Oppenheimer. The, oh, these two films are coming out on the same day. That's hilarious. We should connect them. And to be fair, it ended up generating a lot of hype and made both films a lot of money because everybody knew about them. But I got a bit sick of it. Like anything on the internet, I just get sick of it. Yeah. There's a suggestion that the next Barbenheimer, this article describes it as Barbieheimer. That's hilarious. Saw 10 moves release date to compete with Paw Patrol. Yeah, so we have Saw Patrol. And that's done purely for the name. Both Oppenheimer and Barbie, there was quite a high anticipation for both those movies anyway. And also they're both for the same audience in the sense that they're not targeted to any one specific genre. People are like, oh yeah, here's a, a serious drama about the Manhattan Project and here's a fun comedy drama about Barbie. And feminism. Yeah, they're not actively directed, but this is, here's a kids movie and a horror movie. It's not going to be like, which of these are you going to watch first? Well, the kids are going to watch Paw Patrol, and then they're not going to watch Saw. <laughs> People aren't going to go watch Saw, and they'll be like, I'm going to watch some animated puppies. <laughs> this is the Hollywood learn the wrong lesson situation. What makes these successful? Oh, they both came out on the same day. When really it's, people are always going to be excited for a Christopher Nolan movie. And initially a lot of the excitement came from the Barbie movie when there was the pictures and stuff of like Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie. And they were like, what is this going to be? And It was even before that when Greta Gerwig was directing it because people were thinking, what's Greta Gerwig going to do with a Barbie movie? Yeah, so there's already like a lot of buzz about both these movies anyway. The thing of them both being released on the same day has definitely benefited both of them. Yes, it's generated its own hype, hasn't it? But that's not the only reason they're successful. <laughs> Whereas what they're going to do now is, oh, we need to do two contrasting movies on the same day. But that happens all the time. The Teenage Kraken movie is on the screens and you can also go watch the new Insidious movie, but you don't have to play them off each other. They're acting as if films don't come out on the same day ever. There's always another film you could watch. Yeah, you don't go to the cinema and there's just the one. It's not like the theatre. There's like six screens and six different movies on or whatever. It's not that amazing, but... This has gone, okay, what's opposite? Horror and kids. What have we got? Okay, we've got Saw and Paw Patrol. That's a hashtag. That's going to flounder because nobody's going to watch Saw 10 probably because it's the 10th film in the Saw franchise. Yeah. Didn't Spiral not do that well? 
That didn't do very well. I can't remember if that released as part of streaming as well as Thingy. It was kind of a coming out of the pandemic film. I remember it was in the cinema, but I wasn't interested. I got an email about getting a screener for it, and I just didn't reply. <laughs> I didn't say, yeah, I love this, because I just don't care. I haven't seen a Saw movie since the third one, though. I loved the first one. The first one was a really good psychological, gripping indie horror. The second film was we've ballooned this up to ridiculous standards but it's still kind of okay and then the third one i was like this is just bull i'm not watching another one of these there'll be a lot of this stuff won't there it'll be what two movies are coming out on the same day can we make a hashtag it's kind of an extension of what they were trying to do earlier this year in terms of trying to manufacture a cult hit you had cocaine bear and they tried to make that a cult movie and then the other one was renfield so they were trying to get cult status for these two films but you can't manufacture that it just happens basically to make a cult classic your film needs to fail and then people need to rediscover it later yeah i talked about earlier that blade runner and the thing came out on the same day and they both failed but they're now both cult classics yeah because people when they were able to rent it on vhs or whatever they just reappraised it they saw them and then they just became these things that people love but you're not going to get that now or you're not going to get that if you try and force it it just has to happen and you will never know what it will happen to i'm trying to think of a modern cult classic it kind of isn't one was scott pilgrim one no because that was successful yeah it wasn't crazy successful but it was successful enough it was successful enough to get edgar wright employed again yeah, so it doesn't really count. But I can't think of any movies. There's very few where they just out and out fail and then they get word of mouth later on when they hit streaming or whatever. There are some films that get a second wind on streaming or they get a first wind on streaming as in people discover them. And it's, well, this was actually pretty good, but nobody saw it in the cinema. That does happen. But for a cult thing, it has to be, it was poorly reviewed when it was in the cinema and nobody watched it. And then Yeah, at the time they were poorly reviewed, but now they've gained a little bit of a fan base sort of movies. But they're not really cult. That's just a change of opinion. Yeah, or it's just more people see it and the, the opinion thins out a bit. Yeah. But what they're trying to do here is they're trying to create another barbenheimer type situation where it's let's try and force a mashup between two contrasting properties and hope that it generates a massive box office for both of them because people will do it but nobody manufactured the barbenheimer thing that happened on its own yeah it's just a chance thing that two big anticipated movies came out at the same time it's not something that anybody planned it wasn't factored into the marketing in any way at least not early on once it became clear that that had happened i think that it did influence things yeah then they Shut and down. For example, Warner Brothers just refusing to move the release date of Barbie, which is kind of a shame because it was intended to release in IMAX and premium format screens, and then now it can't. Yeah, because Oppenheimer <laughs> and Mission Impossible. That's Tom Cruise's fault that he didn't get a good run with IMAX, because he knew what the Oppenheimer release date is, and he still chose that for Mission Impossible. He could have picked a time where he had more of a clear run. Oh, well. But a bit of info on Saw 10. It takes place between Saw and Saw 2. Oh, they're doing that, the new horror thing. There was just one. Whatever you think the good one was. No, I think it, they're all still canon. This is just an interquill between one and two. Oh, it's just more so, but in between. It's a bit like when they keep moving that Fast and Furious movie to be set between whatever film they want it to be now. Oh, yeah, whenever Tokyo Drift is set. Tokyo Drift, what was it? It was out in, like... It's set after six, isn't it? It's set between six and seven, but it was the third film. Yeah, so it's supposed to be set in, like, 2018 or something. Yeah. Because of where it's placed in the timeline, but you, you see all the people with flip phones and, and all this stuff. It's ridiculous. Gadgets aren't big in Tokyo. <laughs> it's famously low tech. And you have that 25 year old teenager who's then a 35 year old teenager in the space of a movie. Crazy. And Paw Patrol, the Mighty movie, is the second theatrical Paw Patrol movie based on the beloved animated TV series. McKenna Grace, Taraji P. Henson, Chris Rock who switched allegiances after starring in Spiral, that's even funnier, and Kim Kardashian, along with her children North and Saint West. Yeah. What child abuse is that, calling your kids that? So this isn't going to happen. Nah. But it's always fun to watch studios grab the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. Here's something else that could be the wrong lessons. Mattel is now planning to make films out of absolutely everything they own, because of course they are. Yeah. The list of stuff they want to make includes... Hot Wheels by J.J. Abrams. Vin Diesel's Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Is Daniel Kaluuya's A24 styled Barney the Dinosaur movie part of this? Or is that also just an insane thing? I'm not sure, but I will call up that story. I did forget to put that on the list, actually, so I'm glad you reminded me. I just remembered, yeah, I was trying to think of one, because I know also there's 
it's not really news, but they want to reboot the Lego movie, but make it live action or whatever. It's like, that's what we thought it was going to be before you made the good one. You don't have to make the bad one. <laughs> no, I don't want A24's dark Lego movie, thanks. Yeah. But remember when Rock'em Sock'em Robots was Real Steel and it was really good? Yeah, Real Steel's really good. And now Vin Diesel's going to make it and it's going to suck. The reason Barbie's a movie that has a point is because it's not just a big advert it has a purpose like you're saying it's it's feminist and anti-patriarchy and it has a message to say whereas hot wheels and Viewmaster and those little shaker thingies where you're drawing it or whatever you have to start with the story for well not start with the story first but you have to have a reason for making this and have a point to the story yeah it has to kind of be more than the sum of its parts Kaluuya's barney was announced but i'll find the detail on that in a minute jj abrams struggled to describe the new franchise we're talking about hot wheels Oh, it's always like, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be. We've got, and and we're gonna, but it's gonna be great or whatever. <laughs> he just really has the thing on his feet. We well, said for a long time we were talking to Mattel about Hot Wheels, and we couldn't quite find the thing that clicked. Isn't that when you make the track and you click it together? Isn't that Hot Wheels, or is that Skeletrix? It's when you put the loop and the thing at the bottom that connects to the loop. <laughs> it clicks. We couldn't quite find the thing that clicked. That made it worthy of what that title deserved. He said, then we came up with something emotional and grounded and gritty. What? It was my reaction to that. Can you imagine J.J. Abrams making anything emotional, grounded and gritty? I like J.J. Abrams, but probably no. He's so mediocre. But I like that he'll just do whatever. I think that's what I like about him. He's a real Chris Chib. <laughs> But in the thing I know, he'll turn up and do it and people seem to think he's okay. What I will credit J.J. Abrams with is the ability to make exactly the thing that the studio want. Yeah, that's what he's good at. He will take your notes from the meeting and he'll make exactly that movie. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the list of other Mattel movies, which is proving harder than I thought it was going to be. I love it if Hot Wheels, it's like, yeah, mature and grounded and gritty, and then the trailer starts and it is just a car doing a really big loop. <laughs> <laughs> In the battle arena, and it just hits into another car or whatever. I remember when Spider-Man 3 was getting made, there was a bit of trivia around the visual effects supervisor that was on Spider-Man 2, didn't return for Spider-Man 3 because he was making the Hot Wheels movie. <laughs> It's a bit like that guy that won a trip to the set of The Mask 2. Uh, I'm just trying to find a list of other Mattel stuff. Viewmaster was one. That New Yorker article is actually useless. Is it like 40 different ones or something? If it's a toy, go to the toy aisle in a supermarket, or if you're in a mall, go bask any Toys R Us or whatever. It's whatever. Everything on the shelf has a movie coming. Lena Dunham is directing a Polly Pocket movie starring Lily Collins. Mattel is making an Uno heist comedy. Uno, the card game. Yeah. Ooh. Get Out star Daniel Kaluuya is making an A24 type film about Barney. So it's not actually A24, it's just A24 type. A24 type. Okay. For the A24 guys. It's going to release on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> According to The New Yorker, the movie will be a surrealistic and A24 type film. It is just the same information as like two years ago, but it's still in development. We're leaning into the millennial angst of the property rather than fine tuning this for kids. It's really a play for adults. Not that it's R-rated, but focus on some of the trials and tribulations of being 30-something, growing up with Barney. Just <laughs> just the level of disenchantment with this generation. I mean, I don't want to condemn it because Barbie did a, such a good job of playing around with its property, but that just sounds a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? That sounds like, you know when you go online and there's comedy fake showbiz news where it's like Chang Tatum's bringing his play about, I don't know, skateboarding rats to Broadway or <laughs> dumb things. I think I first read the Daniel Kaluuya serious Barbie movie. I was like, oh, that's a funny spoof. Oh no, this is actually, this is the real discussing film and not like disbussing film or spoof <laughs> film or whatever. Oh, this is real. It's these things that you look at and you think, this cannot be real. Especially because there's quotes like, yeah, it's going to be like one of those thingy movies you like. <laughs> it's like the least professional sounding thing. It's like, yeah, it'd be like one of them. Yeah, it's the least appealing thing about it. Bizarre. Magic 8 Ball is going to be a horror movie. I guess it will just be deciding if people die. Oh yeah, I can see that. It tells you to throw yourself under a bus or whatever. Like that phone movie where it's like you have a timer and it tells you when you die. Oh, you download the app, the countdown, and it tells you when you die. That was alright, actually. They're going to do another live-action Masters of the Universe. That's not surprising. Gritty Hot Wheels, that's also there. It's ridiculous. Christmas Balloon, whatever that is. Christmas Balloon? That was reported in 2021. The family drama, which is based on a true story, follows a young girl living in a Mexican border town where she tries to send a Christmas list to Santa via balloon. But instead, the list is found by a couple in Arizona grieving the loss of their child. 
Oof. Thomas the Tank Engine getting the live action treatment. I can see that. I can see Tom Holland as Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> Mark Forster is going to direct it. I've heard of him. He did Bond movies. He also directed Christopher Robin. Oh, that was nice. I like that one. It was all right. Vin Diesel's Rock'em Sock'em Robots. American Girl, whatever that is. It's just another doll. Yeah, it sounds sort of like a Bratz. Big Jim, whatever that is. Muscly action figure, Big Jim. That sounds... Chatty Cathy and Betsy Wetsy dolls are getting... So well, it's just going to be someone that can't stop wetting themselves. Just the stuff. Just optioned everything. Just put everything on the list. Someone will make it. And if Hot Wheels wasn't enough Mattel car action for you, Matchbox is also on the cards. Oh, they could do the Matchbox Hot Wheels team-up movie. And Fast and Furious. Oh, Fast and Furious. Turns out Fast and Furious has just been a kid playing with toys the whole time. That'd be great. And it's Finn Diesel and he's sat on the floor... And they've built a set, so it's big chairs all over. He's just going, meow, and he's <laughs> driving all these cars around. And this all took place in a little kid's room, and the kid's played by Vin Diesel. A lot of these were announced ages ago. It was just a bit of a roundup of these things. The Viewmaster one, what would a Viewmaster be? It shows you the future or something? I don't know. I know what Viewmaster is. You put these bits of film in, and it just cycles through pictures. Yeah, and you see the lighthouse or whatever. I guess it could be the like portal. Oh, now I can visit the Grand Canyon or whatever, but that's not very fun. Yeah, you see the future or something. Boglins, whatever that is. Gruesome toy hand. Pa- oh, yeah, you put them on your fingers and you were like, meh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you waved them about. Gremlins-ish with a twist. So that's all that. So that's horrible. Yeah. For every 20 of those, one might get actually put into production. I mean, the thing is, this Daniel Kaluuya Barney thing, I don't want it to cry out because it could end up just being this genius thing. But also it's one of those, I don't think the Barbie movie is inherently disrespectful to the whole notion of Barbie, right? All the iconography is still there and it has fun with that. Although I think some parents have completely misinterpreted what the audience actually is because in the screening I was at, there were some parents, they were their young girls and they were bored because it's not for them. There's all those... Oh, straight-to-DVD Barbie movies. Yeah, the animated ones for six-year-olds. There's all those. But yeah, this Greta Gerwig movie is not for your six-year-old kid, funnily enough. So that's a horrible list of stuff. Yeah. So that was it. Our last news item. We talked some stuff. I'm just checking if there's any big... Well, Twitter is now officially (laughs) rebranded. But that's not really new. Oh, does that happen now? Confirmed it'll happen tomorrow. The bird is going to get replaced by an X. Just an X, and now it's just going to be called X. Who cares? That's not really interesting. I mean, is he just trying to destroy the platform? It sounds like when Hermes rebranded as every. <laughs> this isn't broken. This is a new social media one. Thing is, though, how many social media platforms would like their selling features to be just everyday words? You talk about tweeting or retweeting. Yeah, are you going to re-X or make an X story? <laughs> Twitter ended up creating this everyday language yeah. that we now use. Hashtag, retweet, all that stuff. Yeah. And Elon Musk wants to kill all that off? It's because he doesn't know what he's doing. What's his plan? He's crazy. Anyway, that's another insane thing. It's funny when people say, is he Lex Luthor? It's like, no, Lex Luthor's not a moron. Yeah, Lex Luthor knows what he's doing. But he can just have a cage match with Mark Zuckerberg. That sounds like a great idea. I'm trying to think what character Elon Musk is. He's kind of like a Justin Hammer, I guess. I was going to say he's like King Tut from the original Batman. He thinks he's a pharaoh, but he's just a history teacher. Well, Justin Hammer, the MCU version anyway, he's really rich, but he's a moron. And then he's the Glass Onion guy as well. Well, the Glass Onion guy was based on him rather than you can connect him to. Yeah, the other way around. Anyway, he's an idiot. Yeah, he is. Oh, well, (laughs) catch us on X, I guess. Catch us on X. That'll make the wrap-up fun. Send me an X. Isn't X the button you use to close everything? Maybe I'll just do that. Just do that. Just don't. Don't engage whatsoever. I think we're going to get another round of Twitter is dead. Where do we go now? And then it'll blow over after a day or two like it always does. I'm signing up for Blue Sky or Mastodon or whatever other crap people are on now. I missed the last one. I just didn't go on my phone for a weekend. <laughs> I think I was just watching YouTube where I got really into a dumb thing. And then it was like, oh, threads. I missed it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> the rate limit thing, I never experienced it. So I clearly don't go on Twitter yeah, enough same. to hit the 600 tweet limit. A lot of the ones people get upset about is, oh yeah, you can't send direct messages unless you pay. I was like, I've never sent one ever to anyone because <laughs> I just use Messenger. I've sent DMs to people I don't know trying to arrange interviews and things. Yeah. So yeah, there's points where that would make sense for journalism. You're like, I need to contact this person's people or this company. But I guess you can also just email. But yeah, when it's like, you can only see up to 600 tweets a day. Reading that's like seven hours worth of day. 
So it's a lot. For some people, that's five minutes of scrolling. Yeah, I suppose if you don't read it and just scroll really fast, like a Rolodex, then yeah, you'll hit it. For me, it's I see five tweets, get annoyed at one, and close the app completely. Yeah, I'm like, I hate this. Why am I doing this? And it's like, <laughs> well, I'll do now. It's like, I'll open it up again. But okay, here's a bit of news I'll need to take note of. Oh, look, there's some arsehole complaining about women or whatever. Close. Yeah. That's enough Twitter for one day. Yeah. But the fact that the platform is just full of pricks has stopped me from scrolling. But anyway. That's the news. That's July. July news. Yeah. Thank you for joining for this. I'm glad you got a month where you were engaged by quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, this worked out well. We have Captain to Marvel stuff, Superman stuff. Doctor Who. Doctor Who stuff, Wonka, that Poirot that I'm looking forward to. Good month. If only we could predict these all the time, but it was just the luck. Yeah, and thanks again to Chris for covering the things that I don't know about. Yeah, for beaming in and doing these things. Yeah. We remain 100% cameoed up for these news podcasts. Yeah, I enjoy the cameos. It's fun. It's good to just get a different voice for a little while, or a series of different voices, depending on the month. Yeah, and especially if someone actually knows what they're on about. There's no point asking me to, like, oh, yeah, the boys or whatever. I don't know. Although, remember the t- inside baseball again, but at the time there was a last minute scheduling change. So, what I did was I, I had to cut away from Andrew to go to you to talk about Sandman when Andrew knew more about Sandman than you did. Oh, yeah. That was odd. I'm glad I stole that clout. It was funny, because it was originally supposed to be one person that definitely wouldn't have known anything, and then the schedule changed, but I'd already recorded with you, so I had to use it. And then not let Andrew talk about Sandman, even though that's the thing he knows a lot about. I think I actually had to message him. I don't know who this is. It's like a character I didn't know, so I was like, I know Andrew knows Sandman. <laughs> hey, Andrew, I'm supposed to talk about Sandman. Can you tell me who this is? He did get the last laugh. He did get to talk about a later trailer and he wrote a review of the TV show on the website. He got his day. He got his day. But anyway, that was July and we'll have August, hopefully, if we don't get on nuked by Christopher Nolan making yeah. his next film. I want to thank Neil Stenson for the supplied music. And if you like what you heard, please do hit subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast. really. The feed will contain us somewhere just look for us most of those platforms now have in-app rating systems but apple podcasts especially do if you have the ability to rate and review please do isaac i'll ask you how many stars should the people give us if they decide to do so if you can afford five in this troubled times if you can afford to move your thumb slightly to the right of where you might have otherwise then do so What's it going to cost? It's not hard. Like the YouTubers say, leave a like. Leave move. a like. We are on YouTube, but we never worry about it. So you can get us on YouTube. Leave a like if you're on YouTube, yeah, I guess. Leave a like. Hit the bell. <laughs> if you want to discuss anything that we've discussed here, or anything else, really, you can reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter or X. Like X-Men with the R. X. We're on X now. Yeah, just do the X simple part up. By the time this podcast is out, it's probably gone back to Twitter. I don't think we need to worry about it. Or it's dead. And or it's dead. Blue Sky or Hive or some other platform we haven't heard of yet. Just put Neil before blog in, whichever one you're on. Whichever one it ends up being, we'll be there. Well, the safest thing to do to find everything that we do is you can go on neilbeforeblog.co.uk and all the show notes and everything are there. You can leave a comment and they're there as well. So please do that. Reach out to us, have a chat with us. We respond or try to. But as always... You can catch us next time on Neil Before Pod. Goodbye.